Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York Council hearing for the Committee on Economic Development and Higher Education. If you wish to submit testimony, you may at testimony at council.nyc.gov. At this time, please silence all electronic devices. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Council Member Eric Dinowitz, Chair of the Higher Education um, Committee. Thank you. Now it's official. Um, welcome to our joint hearing with the Committee on Economic Development, chaired by Council Member uh, Amanda Farias. While today's oversight hearing is entitled Workforce Development Opportunities at CUNY, it's clear that any opportunities at the City University of New York, or CUNY, are set within the larger context of workforce development here in New York City. So we are fortunate to have the Committee on Economic Development here with us to discuss that broader context. And I want to thank Council Member, uh, Chair Farias for joining us today and for working together with the Committee on Higher Education. Uh, let me begin with a focus on CUNY. Last month, I was honored to be a member of a panel put together by the Center for an Urban Future for a policy symposium on harnessing CUNY as a launch pad into tech careers. The thumbnail description of the symposium referred to CUNY's enormous but still largely untapped potential to serve as a launch pad for New Yorkers of color into well-paying tech careers. As it turned out, many of the remarks that were made at the symposium uh, were actually applicable to many New Yorkers and to careers in many other sectors of the economy as well. Uh, I want to thank Abby Jo Siegel, Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development for uh, inadvertently writing most of the opening statement. Um, you know, it's not plagiarism if you cite your sources. So I'm citing her. She was one of the outstanding speakers on the panel, which also included CUNY Chancellor Felix uh, Matos Rodriguez. Uh, I, I learned a lot from them, and I proudly say that as, as a lifelong learner, which is something you know, I think we all should be. At one point, Executive Director Siegel said something um, that went something like this. What does it take to put career success as a priority of students? What happens when we shift the goal to not being degree completion, but really thinking through career success, earning power of students. What we're talking about here is not marginal shifts if we want to make that change. Uh, many of us in the room know the research that given where today's economy is, most jobs, certainly those that are fulfilling economically, uh, fulfilling economic secure jobs, require an employer valued post-secondary credential, and she cited that number at uh, eight, 85 percent uh, or higher. Um, she continued, it won't just be government, it won't just be CUNY, it won't just be employers, because in order to make the change, we have to do it together. You can't get people into good jobs unless the employers are very much at the table, and we can't leave CUNY out of the picture. CUNY serves too many people, and it's too great a resource, and we can't do it unless government prioritizes this change as our economic development strategy. Talent is our biggest asset. We have to invest in it. Uh, and importantly, it reminded me about some of the work that we're doing in this committee, some of the work that we've highlighted, recognizing CUNY not in a bubble, not in a silo, but in a broader context of what it brings to our city, how we have to work with our institutions before, during, and after CUNY to provide success for our students. Um, and it reminds me of the legislative mission of CUNY, which is to be a vehicle for upward, upward mobility for the disadvantaged in New York City. Toward the end of the symposium, she commented, we have this mindset that you go to school for the first 20 or 25 years of your life, and then you go to work for the next 50, or uh, if you're lucky, 30 years of your life. That's not really reflective of the labor market now, which is rapidly changing. We should be shifting from that linear model to more braided model where you're working and learning, beginning in high school and having it be lifelong. And we need to make sure our educational institutions and our employers are set up for that braided learning model. We can't do that without CUNY. 
That's why the work that CUNY is doing on having people come back, really figuring out how CUNY is that lifelong partner for New Yorkers is gonna be critical. Uh, and you can be sure that uh, Chancellor, the Chancellor responded immediately that CUNY School of Professional Studies, which was created to serve adult learners, can and should be at the center of Executive Director Siegel's braided model. So we look forward this afternoon to hearing more about CUNY's programs that are meeting both the workforce development needs of our city and the education demands of our traditional and adult students to understand in the larger economic development context that we New Yorkers find ourselves in to thinking about what the goal for economic development in our city should be, and to discovering where the gaps, where the gaps are that need to be filled. I want to acknowledge my colleagues on Higher Education Committee who are present, Councilmember Charles Barron, Councilmember Gail Brewer, adjunct professor, Councilmember Oswald Felice, adjunct professor. At CUNY. I'd also like to thank Adam Staropoli, my director, uh, my director of legislation, Jenna Klaus, my chief of staff, <sighs> Chloe Rivera, committee senior policy analyst who's transitioning off the committee, heartbreaking, mm -hmm. Regina Paul, committee's policy analyst, and Nia Hyatt, the committee's senior finance analyst. Uh, I would now like to invite Chair Farias to give her opening statement, after which I will swear in our witnesses. Thank you so much, Chair Dinowitz. And thank you to the members of both committees for coming together to hold this joint hearing. My name is Amanda Farias, and I have the privilege of chairing the Economic Development Committee. We're joined today by council members, I was going to announce everyone, but committee members, uh, Rafael Salamanca uh, and PhD student, uh, Natasha Williams. You could announce all of them. No, no politicians like. And council and members and Brewer and Barron and Feliz who have there joined us. <laughs> While the Economic Development Committee regularly holds hearings on the city's workforce development systems, today's hearing marks the first opportunity for this committee to discuss CUNY's specific role in workforce development. We on the committee look forward to hearing testimony today from CUNY regarding its integration with industries throughout the city, evaluate CUNY's various apprenticeship programs, and understand how CUNY fits into the city's larger workforce development toolbox. In particular, we would like to know how CUNY's job training courses are adapting to the new realities of work, such as college for all versus prepping graduates for career readiness, streamline job processes to connect graduates from accredited courses, bridge programs with, within our institutions, and what efforts CUNY is making to push its graduates towards meaningful, life-sustaining careers. CUNY and the City's Economic Development Corporation launched a partnership for green workforce programs last month to train college students for careers in clean energy. The committee is also interested in hearing more details about that partnership and what role, if any, the council can play in seeing that initiative bear fruit. Additionally, we look forward to hearing from CUNY on their experiences with the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development today, on its efforts to coordinate the city's workforce development efforts by coordinating and improving the city's many workforce development programs. Lots of workforce and development in that sentence. <laughs> and if those have directly impacted the work occurring on our CUNY campuses. In 2020, the Office of Workforce Development updated its work within the five industry partnerships contained in its Career Pathways Plan, healthcare, technology, construction, food and beverage, and industrial manufacturing. Um, each of these industry partnership working groups developed its own plan to combat unemployment during the pandemic, and we would like to discuss how those have performed today as well. The committees hope to hear from CUNY and the Office of Workforce Development about the progress that has been made in adapting to assist the city's economy emerge from the pandemic, how the new administration is focusing on its efforts towards improving the city's workforce development infrastructure, and what, if anything, the council can do in its legislative capacity to assist in those efforts. The focus of this hearing will be able to check in on how CUNY's initiatives have progressed in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and what plans lie ahead for the city's various workforce development programs. Before I turn it over to CUNY, I'd like to just take a moment to thank the staff on the Economic Development Committee, Senior Counsel Alex Polinoff, Senior Policy Analyst William Hongach, and Financial Analyst Glenn Martinelli for all their hard work in putting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my Legislative Director, Rebecca Nieves, for all of her work, and with that said, 
I will now turn the floor over uh, to my colleague and the administration. Thank you, Chair Farias, for your opening statement. I'd like to remind everyone who wishes to testify in person today that you must fill out a witness slip. It looks like this. It's located on the desk at the Sergeant of Arms near the entrance of the room. Please fill out the slip even if you have already registered in advance that you will be testifying in person today. To allow as many people to testify as possible, testimony will be limited to three minutes per person, whether you are testifying in person or on Zoom. I'm also gonna ask my colleagues to limit their questions and comments to five minutes. Please note that witnesses who are here in person will testify before those who are signed into the Zoom webinar. Um, the, I'd like to recognize our first panel and then swear them in. Lauren Anderson from CUNY uh, University Associate Provost for Careers and Industry Partnerships. Kenneth Adams, President of LaGuardia Community College. And Jay McKill uh, Dr. Jay McKillop, PhD, CUNY Dean, School of Continuing Education and Professional Studies, Lehman College. I got all that? All right, great. Um, in accordance with the rules of the council, I will first administer the affirmation to witnesses from the City University of New York who will make up the first panel. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Good, thank you. As a reminder to all of our witnesses, please state your name prior to your testimony uh, for the record. The floor is yours. Lauren Anderson, University Associate Provost for Careers and Industry Partnerships at the City University of New York. Good afternoon, Honorable Chairs Dinowitz and Farias, and members of the City Council Committees on Higher Education and Economic Development. Thank you for the invitation to speak today on workforce development at the City University of New York. My name is Lauren Anderson, and I have the honor of serving as the University Associate Provost for Careers and Industry Partnerships and Chief Workforce Officer at CUNY. In this capacity, I oversee a newly restructured office, the Office of Careers and Industry Partnerships, that was recently elevated to report directly to the Chancellor as well as to the University Provost. I am joined today on the panel by my esteemed colleagues, Ken Adams, President of LaGuardia Community College, and Jane McKillop, Dean of the School of Continuing and Professional Studies at Lehman College. We look forward to sharing an overview of the work underway at CUNY to support a thriving and inclusive workforce in New York City and to answer any questions that you may have. The CUNY Office of Careers and Industry Partnerships has two goals. The first is to ensure that more graduates of CUNY's degree and non-degree programs can successfully launch and advance in careers of their choosing more quickly and at competitive salaries. The second is that NYC businesses and organizations can find the talent, expertise, and services they need to grow and create more job opportunities for New Yorkers. The elevation of this office to sit within the Chancellor's Cabinet is a reflection of the role that CUNY plays as a leading engine of inclusive economic recovery in New York City. New York's recovery must be equitable. It has to lift all New Yorkers, particularly communities of colors and residents who are underrepresented in careers long before the pandemic. No other institution is better positioned to lift up all New Yorkers than CUNY. Advancing economic mobility, as the Chair referenced, is in our DNA. It was instilled 175 years ago with the founding of CUNY's progenitor, a school called the Free Academy. The Free Academy was created to educate and provide access, equity, and opportunity to people from families of modest backgrounds, and importantly, qualify them for usefulness hereafter. Through decades and generations, CUNY has shaped and transformed the city's professional and middle class. It has gained a national reputation for propelling more graduates up the economic ladder than all Ivies, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and MIT combined. And now, CUNY is committed to transforming itself into the higher education system our city needs today and in the decades to come. Central to this transformation is ensuring that even more CUNY students have the exposure, preparation, experience, and connections needed to fuel an inclusive and thriving workforce. As members of your two committees know well, there is no silver bullet to transforming talent pipelines across the city. Together, CUNY is working with public, private, and nonprofit sector partners to advance a constellation of big, ambitious aspirations that aim to transform the way we do business at our core, not just around the margins where it's easy. Before diving into these ambitious initiatives, it's worth sharing the four key principles that drive CUNY's approach to workforce development. Equity, partnership, sustainability, and modernization. 
First, when it comes to equity, CUNY is committed to meeting New Yorkers where they are. CUNY's 25 campuses support 2,806 academic or four credit programs. This includes 670 programs in STEM fields, which constitute many of the critical sectors of the city's economy. Over the past five years, CUNY has deliberately invested in growing the number of degrees awarded in, this, in these areas. Um, as the chair alluded to, for example, CUNY has successfully doubled the number of tech bachelors awarded, and we did that one year ahead of our five-year goal. Additionally, CUNY serves over 160,000 students through non-credit bearing programs, including industry recognized certifications and micro-credentials designed and delivered in partnerships with employers. Whether a New Yorker is just starting off on their career path or looking to gain a specific skill to advance in their chosen line of work, CUNY has solutions to meet their needs. Beyond meeting students where they are, CUNY is also committed to identifying and working to close disparity in career outcomes among our graduates. This includes not just disparities observed by race, gender, and ethnicity, but also other key factors such as socioeconomic and transfer status. Partnership is also essential. Ensuring New Yorkers have the skills needed to thrive and drive a healthy economy cannot be achieved by any one entity alone. At CUNY, we know we must partner with industry, government, nonprofits, and employers of all sizes and sectors in all boroughs to move the needle. As part of this effort, CUNY is thrilled to work closely with the New York City Economic Development Corporation and numerous city and state agencies to achieve this mission. For example, CUNY has a long history of collaborating with NYC EDC on cybersecurity, including launching new degree programs at CCNY. Even the most successful interventions, though, will not make a dent if they aren't sustainable. Ensuring CUNY students are prepared for the workforce is not a one-time project. It's core to our mission. That's why we're pursuing investments and policies that are not only short-term programs to meet the needs of our employers today, but also the long-term infrastructure CUNY needs to evolve as jobs evolve over time. CUNY's philanthropic partners have provided tremendous financial support to pilot effective and scalable workforce solutions, and we're also working with industry to ensure that the taxpayers are not carrying the costs of building a talent pipeline alone. For example, eight CUNY campuses have partnered with Amazon to provide access to degrees for 30,000 workers across the five boroughs with Amazon footing the bill. Lastly, deploying modern tools will be necessary if CUNY is to equip and connect New Yorkers to careers at scale. With over 245,000 degree-seeking students and 160,000 non-degree-seeking students, CUNY needs modern technology to amplify the effect of our faculty, our staff, our employer partners in preparing students for the workforce. Moreover, given the fact that half of CUNY students work while they're in school and have other demands on their time, Career preparation services and connections to employers must be accessible on demand. We must ensure that CUNY has the modern systems needed to make this a reality. So driven by these key principles, CUNY is pursuing a holistic approach to preparing students for the workforce. First, we're focused on increasing exposure to and preparation for potential careers from day one. Before students reach CUNY's doors, we're partnering with New York City Public Schools through initiatives like Future Ready, to increase awareness of potential pathways to careers through career-connected learning. Once at CUNY, students benefit from faculty-led initiatives like the Career Success Fellows that aim to integrate career aspirations into the classroom to help students connect their coursework to the future they desire. We're also ensuring programs deliver skills aligned with industry needs by investing in an industry campus backbone through initiatives like CUNY Futures in Finance, which was created in partnership with Bloomberg, Centerbridge, and Goldman Sachs to increase the number of CUNY students launching careers in the financial sector, or the CUNY, CUNY Inclusive Economy Initiative, which this year will embed industry specialists and hybrid academic and career advisors in 17 departments. With support from Mayor Adams, these industry specialists will focus on tech, healthcare, and climate resiliency, amongst others, since we know that is where the demand is rising. Through programs like Tech and Residence Corps, industry professionals are also recruited directly and trained to teach themselves four credit courses on rapidly evolving in-demand topics like blockchain and cybersecurity. Over 3,000 students across 10 campuses have been taught by adjuncts from companies including LinkedIn, Google, Etsy, and more. And this work is not only focused on degree-seeking students. CUNY just launched a second round of the CUNY Upskilling Initiative, which will provide over $2 million to CUNY adult and continuing education departments to equip over 2,000 New Yorkers with in-demand skills at low or no cost. This new round included specific funds to support employer engagement and the development of credit articulations for specific courses. Second, awareness and skills are not enough. Students also need experience. As many have heard him say, our chancellor hopes to be known as the patron state of internships. 
And we know that CUNY computer science majors who participate in internships are three times more likely to have a job at graduation. But currently, only 9% of students participate in paid internships. Much more has to be done to expand these opportunities. The demand is there. This summer, CUNY Career Launch, a university-wide internship program supported by Mayor Adams to connect 2,000 students to $20 an hour jobs, received 11,000 student applications for 2,000 spots. 88% of the students enrolled had never had a paid internship, and 274 employers participated. Thanks to a new $4 million investment from Governor Hochul, we will be expanding the internship opportunities university-wide this coming spring through a new Spring Forward program. But internships, as you have alluded to actually, are not the only solution. Through partnership with the NY Job CEO Council, five CUNY colleges have also launched paid apprenticeship programs within their Applied Associates of Science degrees. Thanks to these collaborations with EY, MasterCard, and others, students begin to work and earn as part of their degrees. But more needs to be done to meet the scale of demand for these opportunities. Finally, CUNY must work to create proactive connections to career opportunities. Over 40% of our students identify as first in their families to go to college. Many lack professional networks or family connections needed to understand and break into high growth industries. And so we must make these proactive connections to employers for them. We do this by making it easier for employers to navigate to the right destination within the CUNY system by expanding the front door for employers through a new industry support hub located within the Office of Careers and Industry Partnerships. And we partner directly with employers as well as through the NY CEO Council, which has pledged to hire 25,000 CUNY students by 2030. Finally, we're working closely with city agencies to meet the demands of the public workforce. For instance, nearly a third of the city's new teachers each year are CUNY graduates. At Pipeline, we are actively growing in partnership with NYC DOE to meet the needs of our public school system. Ultimately, the success of these initiatives will be measured not just by how many students are served, but by how many students are consistently employed at market rate salaries following graduations in careers that they aspire to. We look forward to working with the City Council to bolster these workforce development outcomes for CUNY students, and thank you very much for your interest and support on this topic. I will now turn things over to President Adams at LaGuardia. All right, thank you, Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone. Is your microphone on? How's that? Uh, I'm wonderful. Kenneth Adams, I'll start over. Um, and as Lauren pointed out, I'm the president of LaGuardia Community College in Long Island City. Good afternoon, Chairs Dinowitz and Farias, and uh, members of the City Council Committees on Higher Education and Economic Development. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today about workforce development at CUNY, and in my particular case, at LaGuardia Community College in Long Island City. LaGuardia's Adult and Continuing Education Division is the largest workforce development organization in CUNY. We serve a diverse group of students from across Queens and beyond through more than 140 adult education courses and workforce training programs. In FY22, our Adult and Continuing Education Division served 9,434 students, most of them low-income Queens residents, many of them immigrants. These individuals come to LaGuardia seeking to improve their English, earn their GEDs, or learn new technical skills in order to get a living wage job and support their families. Now of that total, uh, about 2,600 of those students were young New Yorkers, young people aged 14 tw to 24 in our SYEP program, our Summer Youth Employment Program, which we've run for many, many years. LaGuardia's workforce training programs are designed in collaboration with our employer partners and they serve on our advisory boards and help us design curriculum and training activities. Our training is developed to teach high demand skills and competencies needed by New York City employers today. Most of LaGuardia's workforce training programs are in three basic areas, healthcare, technology, and the construction trades. Before taking a workforce training course, many of our students begin with an adult education program. And given that 47% of the residents of Queens were born outside of the U.S., one of our most popular programs is the TELC, or the English Language Center, where we teach several levels of ESL, English as a Second Language. And the TELC at LaGuardia is the largest English language program in New York City. And it's been around since our founding 51 years ago. Since 1971, we've served over 275,000 New Yorkers from over 80 countries. Now let me take a moment to briefly mention some of the examples of workforce development programs that we're running right now. Just a couple of examples. 
LaGuardia, along with our sister college in the Bronx, Ostos Community College, recently launched an initiative to help low-income communities in Queens and the Bronx that were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's called the New York City Accelerated Workforce Recovery Hub, and it will provide workforce training for high-demand jobs for at least 400 New Yorkers over an 18-month trial period. By helping our colleges, both LaGuardia and Ostos working together on this, expand support services that connect graduates to jobs and higher education, the initiative is expected to impact over 3,000 students as we roll it out. The hub is funded by a seed grant of $1.65 million from the New York Community Trust. Here's another one. LaGuardia's new ACE, ACE stands for Adult and Continuing Education. Our ACE scholarship program is a model, actually a unique model in CUNY. Using funds provided by the LaGuardia Foundation, funds that are raised privately, we provide scholarships to low-income New Yorkers looking for workforce training. This is essential since, as you know, government student financial aid, think federal Pell or New York State TAP, has historically been limited to college students in degree programs. There is no government financial aid for students who just want non-credit workforce training or even ESL or adult education. Students in non-credit workforce training programs have to pay cash, and this has been particularly challenging for low-income New Yorkers coming out of the pandemic. Not anymore at LaGuardia, where we have provided over a million dollars to date in scholarships to students in ESL, GED, workforce training programs like farm tech, plumbing, electrical, electronic medical records, and much more. Here's a third, third example. Um, LaGuardia is grateful for Speaker Adrian Adams' strong support for CUNY Reconnect, an initiative I suspect you're all familiar with. CUNY Reconnect uh, aligns very well with our, at LaGuardia, our Credits for Success initiative. And we launched this initiative back in February to encourage working age New Yorkers with some college but no degree to return to CUNY, in our case LaGuardia, to continue their educations. As the speaker has pointed out, Nearly 700,000 working age New Yorkers are kind of in that category. They started college, often at CUNY, but they never completed their degree. Through the Credits for Success initiative, students with prior college experience enrolling at LaGuardia are able to receive academic credit for the knowledge and skills acquired outside the classroom while they've been working, for example, or serving in the military. Former CUNY students may also be eligible to have their outstanding tuition balances forgiven. The program is funded by a million dollar grant that we got from the Robin Hood Foundation. Our LaGuardia Foundation, our own foundation, where we raise money privately, provides the funding for the debt relief for those students that want to come back, but they have an unpaid balance, which would otherwise keep them from enrolling at CUNY. Here's a fourth and final example. Uh, our new Cyber Analyst Certificate Program. There's a newly created program at LaGuardia. It's designed to meet the growing demand for cybersecurity professionals all across New York City and beyond. The program is taught by industry experts who work in the field. It trains students interested in computer networking repair for jobs that involve protecting organizations, including government agencies, from breaches in cybersecurity. And it helps those students launch their careers as cyber analysts. Now these are just a few examples of the many workforce development programs that we have at LaGuardia. Uh, I thank you very much for your interest in all this, and down the road, be very happy to entertain your questions. Thanks. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair Stinowitz and Farias, and members of the City Council Committees on Higher Education and Economic Development. Thank you for the invitation to speak today on workforce development at the City University of New York. My name is Jane McKillop, and I have the honor of serving as Dean of the School of Continuing and Professional Studies at Lehman College, the only senior CUNY college in the Bronx and a Hispanic and minority-serving institution. Lehman is a recognized driver of economic mobility, and its success has most recently been recognized by Degree Choices, which ranked Lehman number one nationwide among 300 best Hispanic-serving institutions for 2022. It's my great pleasure to tell you about the Lehman College School of Continuing and Professional Studies. Our mission is to create educational and training opportunities as well as entrepreneurship and business development that will enhance the economic security and expansion of our community. 
The Bronx, as you know, is one of the poorest counties in New York State, whose health and economic outcomes need all of us working together to remedy. We're the bridge between the college, and by extension CUNY, and the Bronx. We fulfill Lehman College's fourth strategic plan goal, that is commitment to community, a goal which undergirds the college's strategic direction on workforce development and upward mobility. The School of Continuing and Professional Studies comprises four interconnected programs and an off-site location, CUNY on the concourse. The focus of our education and workforce development programs is in three main areas, health, business, and IT. Before the pandemic lockdown, we served around 13,000 community residents per year, but, but fewer since then. And that's about half of the total number of people attending the college. We provide tuition-based tuition preparation for 32 certificates and licenses. In 2021, 3,557 people completed training to obtain certification. The workforce program manages the grant and contract funded training programs. For example, over 200 out of school youth, high school students and home health aides are trained annually in medical fields. Beginning summer 2022, Lehman in partnership with the SBS and NIH launched the NCLEX RNE English Language Learning Training Program, which I have to tell you was modeled on LaGuardia. So thank you, LaGuardia. Um, to enable internationally trained nurses to improve their English language skills and obtain licensure and employment as registered nurses. The Small Business Development Center supports startups and small businesses with access to capital and business support. In the year just ending, Bronx SBDC served 743 businesses, saved or created 706 jobs, and accessed almost 18 million in economic impact. Finally, the adult degree program enables adults who, as Ken mentioned, have some college but no degree, a real target area for CUNY, to get across the finish line and complete what they've started. These four programs open up a world of opportunity. Located in the old Alexander's Department Store building is Lehman's off-site location, CUNY on the Concourse, which consists of high-flex-enabled classrooms, labs, and a business development center. Since 2015, the Bronx Business Tech Center at CUNY on the Concourse has been funded through an allocation from the City Council, thank you City Council, providing training in AR, VR technology, other IT training, and supporting the Bronx Business Tech Incubator clients. The City Council allocation has also supported the Small Business Internship Program in which students are trained in practical business skills and then intern for four weeks with a local small business, which is also in turn supported by the SBDC. This virtuous circle of interconnecting opportunities is an example of CUNY students having the exposure, preparation, experience, and connections needed to fuel an inclusive and thriving work workforce. Another example of this virtuous circle is the Tech Talent Pipeline, CUNY 2X, which trained and placed in internships over 160 students, 61 of whom obtained job offers within three months of, over, of an average of 89,000 a year. And students have been employed at Apple, Amex, Home Depot, and Zillow at annual salaries of over 100,000 a year. COTC, CUNY on the Concourse, hosts a number of grants and contracts, including the Business Technology Mentorship Program for the Tech Incubator clients and other New York City small businesses. This, provided a, this created a free program in emerging technologies and mentoring for 214 businesses in the five boroughs in 2021. Another grant to assist businesses was the SBS-funded New York Means Business, which focused on businesses in communities hardest hit by the pandemic, such as MWBEs. The funding enabled us to provide digital skills training to 149 small businesses and their 348 employees. As Associate Provost Anderson has mentioned already, the upskilling initiative at Lehman College was aim is aimed at supporting community members and students by providing relevant short duration skills-based training to meet New York City's employment demand. Upskilling so far has served 680 participants, 
350 Lehman College students and 330 community residents and has run 34 courses. Early in 2022, it became clear that the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act was going to affect New York State by opening up a previously illegal agricultural and retail business sector. In January, Lehman offered a Science of Cannabis certificate course in partnership with McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. In spring 2022, Borough of Manhattan Community College in Lehman applied for funding from DOL. We, we got two million over three years for the first cannabis workforce and business development training program. This is for all interested, but specifically for justice impacted people planning to take advantage of social equity licenses. The program includes training by BMCC in customer service, becoming a harvester or cultivator and security. And Lehman College will work with entrepreneurs who've obtained a license to start and manage cannabis related businesses and they'll be housed at CUNY on the concourse. These are some examples of the four key principles that drive CUNY's approach to workforce development, equity, partnership, sustainability, and modernization. I would like to add another key principle, which is innovation. We are nimble in addressing emerging opportunities in economic and professional development, as is shown by our response to the emerging cannabis sector. We think outside of the box as was shown in our response to the COVID lockdown by offering free grant funded training for small businesses and the virtuous circles of internships for students linked to employers. Thank you so much for the opportunity to describe Lehman's workforce development or, or some of them. Thank you. I know that was some, I know that the work you do is extensive. So I know that was some, I, I love this phrase virtuous circle, which I think a lot of my questions are going to focus on. I just want to get some of the, the, the numbers for us. You had said 20, 2,806 career-related credit-bearing certificates, or? No, that is degree. Degrees. Overall. Any sort of credit-bearing, so associates, bachelors, or, or certificates. Okay. I didn't take a good note-taking course in college, so that's where that, that came from. Uh, that's, that's a, okay. Um, and you mentioned 160,000 students in non-credit certificate courses. Yes, that's right. What the, the, how many certificates and micro-credentials does CUNY offer? So if you are looking at the credit-bearing side, we offer about 430 of them um, across 22 campuses. But when you're looking at the non-credit bearing side, part of the challenge at CUNY is that we don't have a single system for collecting all of the non-degree program enrollments or registrations. They're reported by each college in terms of enrollment um, and headcount, I believe, is the other one. Um, and so essentially the challenge is that we've never had a central system for collecting all of the various ways that students are participating in non-degree programs. But we have it now. We are in the process of implementing it. You already got my next question was why, <laughs> but uh, okay, good. So, so this goes kind of to the to the virtuous circle, which I think I think is a good fra phrase. I, in my opening statement, I, I mentioned the Braden model. Um, I, I, there's lots of different ways to describe this, but when we, what determines, or how does CUNY or an individual campus, I guess in this case, determine what micro credentials, what certificates, and what degrees they are going to offer? Would you all like to start with the campus perspective and I'm happy to add to it? Yeah, that's a good way to start. L let's try it that way. Uh, <laughs> just one campus's answer. Um, you know, we, my colleagues and I at LaGuardia work off the principle that a workforce training program starts and ends with an employer. So what we can't do is sort of just think up something because it sounds good or even a great faculty member says it's a wonderful idea. We could, but it wouldn't be effective. It wouldn't be effective. <laughs> and so we really have to have good relationships with employers across the sectors that I mentioned, like healthcare, IT, construction, and so on, and let them take the lead in sort of indicating where training programs are needed uh, and indicating in that process what skills and competencies they're looking for and to get them to help us develop the training curriculum. There's a flexibility in non-credit workforce training programs that you don't have in degree programs. 
because our workforce, you know, we put together a program in electronic medical records with Wild Cornell Medical Center, for example. They wrote the curriculum for us. And as long as we know it's working and the students are learning the skills and getting the jobs and being successful, you know, that's, that's the check on that. Unlike can, I, can I pause there just to ask what does success look like? Success looks like a high completion rate of students in a training program, you know, 80, 90 percent finish. That's and what that's what is at LaGuardia it, for most of our for most of our programs. Yes. And so, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I just yeah. want to make sure I get my questions. We'll go back. I, I'm not going to not let you finish. I just want to make sure. So your general completion rate is 89 percent, which you consider a high rate. And does CUNY generally have those numbers yet, or that's something that you're working on? So for non-degree seeking programs, each campus collects it individually and in varying ways with varying metrics, so we don't have a single system yet for that. That's what we're implementing. I love that word, yet, because you're implementing it. And, and so those are one of the metrics. Completion rate is one of the metrics that you're going to use to determine the success of the program. And is there a specific target? Is is 89% the target for success? I mean, is that how you determine whether it is successful? No, you, that's the first metric, but it's not the important one. The important one is that is the student getting the job for which she's been seeking training uh, and being successful in that job and getting a wage gain, right, from if someone worked in retail and at minimum wage and came to LaGuardia for a workforce training program in IT, success would be getting a job in, in that field of interest and a higher wage, right, a living wage. So we want people to ramp up in wages and we want them to get the jobs that result from the training. Okay, and, and by the way, I know I'm looking at you because you're talking, but the questions I'm asking are really for anyone who's able uh, to answer. And what is your, I guess, success rate of students getting employed and also staying employed and how how long do you track the students um, after they've left your program and, and and gotten employed to know if they you know kept their job or got promotions is that data that you track so i can answer that for the university system as a whole cool. um, for any sort of credit bearing program or degree program for example yes we have something that actually is public and available that anyone can use it's called our wage dashboard and so you can look and see by program across every campus what are the wage outcomes for students a year out five years out ten years out we do that in partnership with the New York State Department of Labor wage record system that is wonderful and very helpful but not entirely complete or sufficient. It doesn't tell us things like occupation, for example, that students are looking to move into or have moved into. And so we've also recently put in place a pilot cap and gown survey to really understand at time of graduation are people graduating with these offers. Okay, so metric we got completion, we got job placement and salary, but we don't have which jobs they have, is that? We don't have their titles. Okay, so we don't know if they're getting promoted, for example, uh, we within the field. We will know from a monetary perspective if they get okay. promoted, but not in terms of titles. Unfortunately, the state is not collecting that information to provide it. Do you want a complicating detail here? Well, lo I love it, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, Vice Chancellor Anderson is referring to a system that's used around the country where you use the unemployment Wait, the tax system, right, because you have to pay unemployment taxes to the state and you have a social security number tagged to that and you can get from the, start to the, the, the State Department of Labor UI system uh, the, the wage of the person that is paying unemployment, when the employer is paying it for that person and you can get the general sector, the general industry. But this only works for students in CUNY that have been pursuing a degree are and in this CUNY general database, like of student records, because then there, you know, there's a social security number, there's a student that, you know, you graduated, you went on with your, you know, degree, and we can do that check with the Depart State Department of Labor to see how you're doing. But for the students in our continuing ed programs, right, that are not in, they're not in the CUNY centralized database system. As Lauren was explaining, they're in our own systems unique to every campus. So number one, there's a, there, there are two tracking systems. But we are working to consolidate the latter, right? We're getting a new system for all of the 25 schools to track the outcomes for their non-credit students. Here's the wrinkle. Um, 
in our programs, we have our workforce programs, we call them either fee-based, like you want to take the program, you have to t pay tuition, because remember I said before there's no financial aid, or grant funded. So I mean, Jane mentioned some programs funded by the city, we have funded by the federal. Some, some of our workforce programs are grant funded. Those funders will require uh, that we track, you asked before, Mr. Chairman, like six months out, 12 months out. Those funders build that into the system that we count those individuals, we track them, we know they're, they're on the job, they're earning money, they're getting a promotion. When our programs are fee-based, i.e. someone walks down Thompson Avenue and goes into one of our IT tech training programs and pays the tuition out of their pocket, it's much, much harder to track them because to keep the tuition low and affordable, we just do, we can't afford the infrastructure to have someone calling and surveying and tracking them down and we're not part of the broader CUNY system. This will be fixed when, as Lauren points out, these systems come together. So for the meantime, we track CUNY students who receive degrees through the State Department of Labor, and then at the campus level, our non-credit workforce training students, we track them because of the requirements of grant-funded programs, and then individually, we do our best, cell phones, surveys, right, to keep up with them. Uh, we also offer courses in a continuum, so when you do plumbing one, if you come back for plumbing two, we know that you're about to get a promotion, right? There are many succession courses, so we keep students our ESL students, for example, will transition into workforce training programs. Our GED students will transition into an IT program. And so we can stay in touch with them. Okay, good. And so it's, uh, but, but based on, okay, that's good. It, it's a less than perfect answer, I realize. But the answer is the answer, right? It is what it is, but, it, but, but that you're centralizing some of the data. And this is, by the way, throughout the hearings we've had since January, it seems that there has been a lot of missing centralized data, whether it's workforce development or some of the other hearings we've had, but it is um, encouraging to hear that it, with this system, more of the data is becoming centralized. So, because the purpose, but the purpose of this is to find out the success and how we could do better for our, our students. Uh, and without that, it's kind of hard to, to measure the, the impact of these programs. Um, so I, I I'm going to ask a question, but I'm going to guess we don't have the full data yet. Um, this this um, symposium I mentioned in uh, my introduction, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me, uh, a little sad, but but interesting, is that you know, when it comes to CUNY students versus, let's say, pr uh, students who attend private college, um, beyond the opportunities for internships that the students at private colleges have for various reasons, um, companies are, are more likely to employ students who go to, let's say, Columbia, NYU, than a CUNY student, less likely to, and I'm going to put this in heavy quotations so anyone who's reading a transcript will see it's in quotations, take a risk, and for video, take a risk, um, on CUNY students. Are you tracking or are you able to compare the outcomes for your students versus the outcomes for those in the private sector? in the private sector, rather, uh, private universities? So we do have the ability to do comparative um, outcomes. Our Office of Applied Research Evaluation and Data Analytics, or ARITA, is able to um, look at our institutions compared to other higher education institutions. And um, the important thing to note there is market. So like, it does not make sense to compare us to everyone in New York. It really has to be in the same communities, in the same areas, because the job opportunities are really specific to those regions. But yes, they could do that. That's data, because that is interesting, right? Because we're, I mean, it's essentially you're competing. There are CUNY students are competing against, you know, like I said, Columbia, NYU students, and all sorts of other private colleges we have in New York City. We have CUNYs throughout New York City. Uh, before I continue, I do want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Members Kagan, uh, and Riley. Um, I, I'm interested in, in two other things. I'm going to, um, I want to make sure Councilmember Farias has an opportunity to ask questions and our members and I have a bunch, but two things. One is I, I visited CUNY on the concourse. I was really very impressed with the, um, the, the small business incubator. I'm not sure that's the right term, but really providing consultation, CUNY students uh, providing consultation to some of our small businesses. And you mentioned in your um, testimony partnership with SBS. Um, but I, I kind of want to, I'm interested to drill down on the word partnership um, because the, the grant opportunities, in your, and, and I know you mentioned they're tracking data that, that these grants require, but I, I, I went on 
the Small Business Services website um, to look for, you know, very easily find, you know, uh, c consultants. I didn't easily find CUNY on the concourse as one of the opportunities I have as a small business to get support. And I'm wondering what work, if any, I know work's being done on data, but what work, if any, is being done or can be done to more closely work with SBS to really integrate the incredible opportunities that you're providing for the community um, and that you're provide and that SBS and, and you are providing for the students to more tightly integrate that as a service that the small business serve that SBS provides for the broader community and to really readily make that available and and just to make very clear I, I, when I visited you know we're talking about students who speak a multitude of languages and we know language access has been a a, a consistent issue especially with this council but a lot of the problems that our small businesses face. Um, Language access has been one of those issues for them. Getting things like PPP loans. Um, we know businesses in the Bronx just like didn't get them. So again, what work, if any, is being done in collaboration with SBS to provide those services to do that outreach beyond the, the grant, the funding of the grants? So we, we worked with, <coughs> with SBS on two grants that, that I referenced. And so they would be advertised on their website. They wouldn't be advertised as at, Q, at the OTC. Necessarily, they would be advertised as, as at Lehman College. So the, 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 but they are located at, um, uh, at CUNY on the concourse. Um, and the services that we offer at CUNY on the concourse are on our website. We, sh we absolutely should link them to SBS if that's going to be helpful, but the actual grants are very clearly, I think, uh, on, on their uh, website. Right, I mean, please. Oh no, I was just gonna say at a slightly more macro level, so obviously our SBS colleagues are not here to testify to all of the ways that they work right. together with CUNY, but um, for instance, if a small business were to go to a Workforce One Center to hire, that Workforce One Center, which is run by SBS, has many local partnerships with community-based organizations, and so the SBS Workforce One Centers in the Bronx would know that these programs are going on at Lehman College, Hostos, Bronx Community College. They're part of the local community partner network, so there's a lot of referrals that happen on the ground in these walk-in centers to make sure that small businesses connect at a local level. But even more broadly, we at a central level have been working really closely with SBS specifically as it relates to MWBE support, yeah. um, as well as student entrepreneurs to make sure that CUNY students and our uh, supplier diversity work is leveraging SBS's networks. Yeah, and I, and, I do, uh, and I do at some point, not some point after the hearing, if you could send over the demographic data of the students that you provide, right, non-credit, credit, micro-credentials, et cetera. Um, and the, the last question I have for now, and I'm gonna turn it over to my, my co-chair, does speak to that macro level. It's something I've I brought up at the last hearing. It's something that seems to be a consistent theme, is that the work you're doing and, and the steps you're taking really, um, I think, are impactful to our city and can be more impactful. But when I go online and I Google, I need a job or I need job training, y'all don't show up, right? You know what shows up is DeVry, all these, everything else except CUNY. And it seems a real shame to me that it is not easy. It, and it's the same sort of issue with being really integrated with, with, um, with the work for you know, Economic Development Corporation, being integrated with SBS, that it's, and it's the same thing you raised about um, you know, a lot of the internship programs you have, a lot of the jobs you're placing are based on relationships. So it almost seems to me that there needs to be, I don't know, a, a, a employed a development person, an advertising person. If, if you have that, cool. Um, but it seems to me that there's more work to be done to be developing those relationships with the private industry, but more importantly, kind of, you know, selling yourselves and making sure that the programs you have are readily available and well advertised. The answer last time was, well, these colleges spend $100 million on advertising. Uh, I don't know if, I think maybe that was a made up number. I don't know. Once things get above like $1,000, I, I have trouble like fathoming the amount of money that exists, but um, the, what initiatives do you have, or ha since the last hearing, since the previous he hearings, have any efforts been made to hire a, 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 you know, a, a development person, a coordinator, 
to one, do outreach to more businesses, to develop more relationships, and to really, you know, sell the services that CUNY has so you can attract more people looking for, looking for training in their jobs. So, please. I mean, I, w I will say two things at a high level and then turn it over to my colleagues who do this every single day on the ground. Um, it does take work to build relationships with job seekers as well as with employers. And historically, CUNY has not had a very robust uh, infrastructure that's supported for engaging employers, like specific folks who are dedicated to doing that, not just within career services offices, but within adult and continuing ed and with other departments as well. That's not usually a thing that historically over the past couple of decades has been funded as part of our infrastructure. That is fortunately changing. The CUNY Inclusive Economy Initiative is an example where we're supporting tax levy lines for industry specialists in particular sectors to build those relationships with the community and with businesses. So we hope to see that grow. Um, and in addition to marketing, something that's really important to note is not just the work you're doing uh, to advertise, but what are the institutional funnels that will bring people in the door? So one example, you mentioned NYC EDC. We are starting to embed in their uh, economic development programs a link and a preference for CUNY talent pipelines. The property tech RFP that they just put out is a great example. Cybersecurity is another, because you need that sort of institutional structure, not just did someone see this ad in the right place. But I, I wonder, because your point is well taken, that's still very important, if my colleagues have anything to say about their approaches to community engagement and marketing too. A, a high level <laughs> answer and then something a little more specific, but back to your observation earlier about what you Googled. I suspect, Mr. Chair, that if you Googled, I'm looking for a degree, CUNY would probably come up in somewhere, right? But when you say I'm looking for job training, CUNY doesn't come up. And that's the problem. I mean, I'm going back to what you put your finger on because I couldn't agree more, that that's a challenge. Yeah. And I think part of it is the long-held view, the, rep the great reputation of CUNY as an institution with its 25 schools and everything, um, f where people go to get a degree, you know, as a degree-granting institution, where the goal of attending CUNY is to get an associate or a baccalaureate or graduate degree. And what the chancellor is doing, and I think this is, this is really important and, and, and all of us are trying to advance this work at the local level, is saying that's not enough. To really be a driver of economic mobility, to really be a driver of the New York City economy, um, CUNY has to ensure that its graduates get jobs, that there has to be a job. Uh, put another way, I don't know any students at LaGuardia that say they're just coming for a degree. No, they're coming to get a job. They're coming to get an education that leads to a job so they can put money in their pocket and food on the table. And they're, so they're, the outcome they seek is a job at a living wage. And we need to do a better job so that when you go into your phone, right, to say that there's a lot of ways can you can do that. First among them, by granting you a degree, but also with all these workforce training programs we're talking about this afternoon, these are programs that from three to six to nine months give you the skills that you need to get a good job at a living wage in these sectors that we're talking about. But oh, it's not a degree, it's a certificate, it's a different type of credential. It's not a, you know, this whole theme in this country for years, right? Everyone has to go get a baccalaureate degree. Yes, that's a good goal, but for many people, there's no time, there's no money, there's something else in between on a way to that, which is a practical credential that gets me a job, money in my pocket, food on the table. That's the moving the needle on workforce outcomes as opposed to simply focusing on degree outcomes is a mission of the chancellor, I think it's fair to say, and one that we're trying to work at the ground level intensively. And in terms of marketing, m listening to you, I'm, 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 we spent, we have no money in our LaGuardia budget and I'm right for marketing, we have 20,000 students. So I think it's word of mouth, you know, and our community partners, we couldn't do it without them. I actually know a great uh, incubator, uh, CUNY on the Concourse, that can help you with your, uh, your advertising. They have the marketing expertise. Thank That's you. So, 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 if I could so we'll ask her how she could help, she could help your university in uh, advertising your great you programs. Okay. Um, uh, I, think, I think you've, you've hit on a, a huge gap. You're absolutely right that you, you Google, I need a job, and CUNY doesn't turn up. But the reason is exactly what President Adams said, because a lot of people come to us through word of mouth. 
the principal reason when we do surveys of our students, how did you find out about our program? Oh, my auntie told me, or you know, the person down, down, downstairs. And that's really a very, very powerful way to, to recruit students. And also, as, as Ken said, through employers in the, in the Bronx, the primary um, uh, in, um, uh, area of employment is healthcare. That's a huge thing in the Bronx, and that's how we recruit people is, is through the health pr um, providing agencies, the hospitals, the doctor's offices, and so on. A lot, of, a lot more of this is word of mouth, perhaps, than we, we take credit for. Yeah, I mean, I recognize the word of mouth is very powerful, and I, and I do want to highlight and uplift and encourage you to do more work with our high schools. Yes. Um, it's stri like not not enough. I, I mean, it's, you know, um, and we talk about word of mouth, and you think about sort of I don't know groups of people who are who are talking to each other. Very often, the the the, the students who are most marginalized, who most need to hear that there are opportunities outside of a bachelor's degree, outside of even an associate's degree. Um, the students that I taught for 14 years who were struggling just to get, you know, the a local diploma, and if they had been provided this, this opportunity or knew about this opportunity as a legitimate and successful pathway for them, I think they would have found a lot more success uh, early on. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Chair Farias. Finally. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think first and foremost, I'd like, oh, I have to acknowledge Councilmember Gutierrez has joined us here today. Um, and, and I recommend bringing back to your advertising or IT department a, a quick key log advertising. Uh, so the next time Chair Dinowitz Google searches, how can I find a job? Uh, CUNY is at the top of it. It's pretty inexpensive. I'll be clear, I'm not looking for a new job. Say. Just anyone watching. <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, but I have some workforce uh, oriented questions that I'd love to kind of go through and I'm sorry if they feel a little jumping around because you've sparked a lot of different questions as, as you've all testified. Um, so first and foremost, could you provide some examples of how CUNY has worked with other agencies? I know we've mentioned NYCDC, a, a pseudo agency, also SBS, um, but can you mention how they've worked with other agencies on its workforce development initiatives? Any? Sure, again, I'm sure my colleagues have a number of examples, so happy to turn over them too. Um, we collaborate in a number of ways. One is working with agencies that have a specific line of sight into how the economy is evolving and where jobs will be in the future. So we have partnerships with multiple agencies, yes, SBS, yes, EDC, but also Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and others who see workforce, Department of Ed, who see workforce shortages and can help inform us from that okay. perspective as uh, demand and employers. Additionally, we work really closely with um, agencies not just as partners for training their clients, but partners for training their staff. So our School of Professional Studies has a very robust relationship with several city agencies to be able to actually embed themselves to do training for, I believe they have a program with ACS and several others, so that staff on the ground are receiving this training in partnership with CUNY schools. Um, and then additionally, we do partner um, as vendors or partners together with city agencies who are looking to launch specific programming for specific types of clients. Um, Jane obviously mentioned one of the ways in which uh, Lehman has partnered with SBS, but we have examples of that across the board with other city agencies who have partnered directly with CUNY to support specific um, programming. DYCD and DCLA are two as well that obviously have partnered with us on career launch across all of CUNY and the um, CUNY Cultural Corps, which is an internship program. But there are many examples. Great. Two, two uh, quick ones that I'm, are, I think, good examples for LaGuardia. The uh, New York City Department of Education, DOE, uh, the cafeteria, school cafeteria workers, they're represented by DC 37. School cafeteria workers can come to LaGuardia for our program in um, nutrition and culinary arts. And that is a 60 credit associate degree program. But they can take most of the classes at night. The union benefit fund from DC 37 covers all of the tuition. When you complete the program and get the degree, you get a promotion to school cafeteria supervisor. You are now the boss of the school cafeteria and you get at least a $20,000 wage gain. 
Um, we've run this for a number of years. I just signed a renewal of the contract with DC 37 and DOE, so it's an example of one of those partnerships. Second one, brand new, um, DOHMH, Department of Health and Mental Health, which is based nearby in Long Island City, which is nice for us. Um, we've just launched a federally funded program to train mental health peers. This is a program where we recruit individuals from across the city, not limited to LaGuardia students by any means, who have experienced a diagnosis with a mental health condition. Um, we train them to leverage their experience with their diagnosis so that they can be of assistance to people who are going through treatment for a mental health condition. And this is, it's almost like a coach sort of position. It's not clinical, but it's someone who can be on the front lines in an emergency room, in the back of an EMS truck, with someone who's experiencing a, a mental health condition or trauma. And these peers, um, again, this is a program where we have a lot of support for DOHMH. We had to put together a kind of complicated partnership a third of the training is an internship, a paid internship, at a facility, again, could be an emergency room, a community-based organization, where they're providing assistance to people, again, that peer support to help them get through the treatment or succeed in their treatment plan. Um, we just launched this, and again, we are, have a debt, really, to DOHMH. Uh, just another example. The, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, perhaps I could add some, some sort of much smaller scale examples. We work with community-based organizations such as Westside Housing, New Jewish Home, we do training for them. We also work with unions, particularly with 1199. We have several programs with 1199, so we're working with the Hospital Workers Union. And then we also work with um, manufacturing companies such as GAL, where we're training their employees in English language so that they will be able to um, manage in an emergency so that they have the sufficient language on the shop floor to be able to cope with any kind of emergency situation and just to, to navigate the work. Yeah. That's great. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry, I just okay. bad a footnote. <laughs> so I, your question, Chef Arias, is really, really important. It's a, it raises a broader theme, if I may, of how do we build stronger connections between CUNY and the New York and, and New York City as the biggest employer in town? After all, New York City government is yes. it is the biggest employer, and the biggest company, right? So, another quick example: when I was at, uh, as you will recall, um, Bronx Community College, we had a partnership with New York City DEP, Division of Wastewater Management, down on Queens Boulevard. What was that? And that it called it was called Electronic Engineering. It was an AAS degree, 60 credits. And DEP needed our students, our graduates, to work in sewage treatment plants to monitor water quality. And, and, and basically the degree, this is an engineering, this is a, sort of a junior engineering degree. It turned out that training in that program was exactly what the HR department at DOP, it's about 1,500 people, wastewater management, was looking for. It created a pipeline. And so, again, what I'm coming back to, and I love your question for this reason, is how do we create more pipelines between the, I'll be biased and talk about our community, our seven community colleges that have these technical training programs, right? And very specific titles that are good paying union jobs. And I don't just mean the city, I could say the same about the MTA and state agencies as well. That's, I think, a really important opportunity. Sorry. No, I mean, this is exactly why I was asking this question. I mean, I come from a background, as, as we've spoken about, and we know where we overlapped at Bronx Community College, working at a nonprofit organization who was providing a accredited apprenticeship with the that was registered with the Department of Labor that actually mm -hmm. flowed people right into a municipal job, right? That wasn't just a job, it was a career. And so for, for me or for us looking at this um, from a city perspective as folks that are, you know, trying to look at the larger scheme of where our recovery is and where is our economy going and how do we get people back to work, Really, in our own backyards, we have streamed pipelines that are connected from high school to a CUNY, to a unionized job yeah. um, that has a curriculum, that has a multitude, really like a, a tree with a bunch of branches into a multitude of titles that are life-sustaining career opportunities. Um, I, I appreciate the answers, and I know it, we can probably talk about that one topic for a really long time. Um, but 
it is really important to look at these initiatives and how they can connect back to our municipal workforce. The city is the largest employer, um, and we have to do better at connecting the people most in need, the people um, in industries that may be phasing out, and what could those credentials be matched to to put them into another opportunity. Um, and so I just wanted to ask, and I know you've touched on this a little bit, um, I, I have a question here that says, what tools does CUNY use to determine what areas the city should be prioritizing um, when developing these workforce initiatives? But I feel like you, you touched on it lightly. Are there specific data points or trends um, that we, we see, I don't know, every time we fiscally forecast or anything like that where maybe CUNY readapts some of their trainings or are we seeing consistency because we are doing a partnership with DC 37 and so we know that workforce will always be retiring and there will always be a need to fill gaps. Um, what kind of tools are we using to uh, prioritize where these workforce development programs are created? Yeah, so at a high level, on the degree side, you cannot apply to move forward a degree program through CUNY unless you state in it evidence that there is demand for it in the labor market. And there are a number of tools that campuses use to use that labor market information, including Lightcast is one that we have across the board um, for the private sector and for the public sector. That is oftentimes not sufficient. So to go back to something President Adams said, oftentimes those high level numbers don't really give you the complete insight you need to know whether or not a particular job is actually gonna be something that is open and accessible to someone who has a particularly aligned credential, which is why we work so closely with the employers themselves and the agencies themselves that lead to those roles. So um, depending on which part of the workforce you're looking at, the ways that we approach that can be different. Um, we do partner very closely with DCAS and others to understand across the city's workforce, where are sure. their gaps, how might you build programs out around that, and have encountered uh, together some challenges with doing that and where there might be policy mechanisms that could be put in place to open that up. Um, but on the employer side, as President Adams mentioned, it's a combination of labor market information, talking directly to employers, having employers on your advisory council, and in some cases, where new programs, degree or non-degree, don't need to be created whole cloth anew, there's actually an opportunity to partner with industry to teach slightly updated and improved courses in a particular program. And the reason for that is there may be some things that are consistent, consistent partnerships that you've built with agencies or employers over time, but those skills are very likely evolving no matter what the consistent mm -hmm. pipeline is. So we have various tools to do that. Great. Okay. If, if I could. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do you want to know? I the, see you inching in. The to, local, to well, the local perspective from a campus anyway. Um, you know, I think, you know, we've heard a lot about sort of, you know, the great resignation uh, and a lot of people leaving jobs and leaving, including the municipal and state workforces, and it's true. Um, and that give us a, gives us a chance to think about programs we have that are already solid and successful. Uh, before we run and invent new ones. Because indeed, we, uh, an example at LaGuardia, and we've always done a lot in healthcare. We're in the middle of an initiative I call 3,000 Heroes. Because by 2027, five years hence, we will have trained 3,000 nurses, LPNs, EMTs, and paramedics for the city of New York. 3,000 Heroes. We don't need to create any new program, you know, and, and we can keep doing that. And we can actually, with new resources, addition, we could probably exceed that number of 3,000 heroes. We need to do, we need, we desperately need to do better at LaGuardia in terms of uh, training bilingual special ed teachers for the DOE. I mentioned the DOE before. We have an early childhood education program. We just brought on a new professor who's a specialist from the DOE in special ed and we gotta ramp that up. What I'm saying is I think a lot of the opportunities out there can be served through training programs that we already have that may need to be scaled up or slightly improved or before we run out and do something new. Great, thank you for that. And just in, in relation, and I know we spoke about this right before we, we started this hearing, but can you speak a little bit more about how CUNY is working with students um, uh, to create the job pipelines that are beyond the skill sets they're, they're learning more of the job adjacency and that you know branch out that we were we were kind of talking about one of the best ways to do that 
for our students, whether they're in non-credit certificate programs or seeking degrees, and Lauren mentioned it, are, are paid internships. And we have precious few in CUNY, and it's a real problem. You cannot dream what you've never seen. And our students haven't seen those jobs, and so they don't understand this concept of job adjacency where you get an internship, now let's say as, how, as a junior bookkeeper in a financial services firm downtown town here somewhere, because you're an accounting major and you're you want to transfer to Baruch, and, and it's that internship where you start to look around and say, wait, what is that person doing? That's an interesting job. It wasn't what I went to school for, but that person's making more money or having more fun or, what, or doing some interesting work. So you gotta get in there with that internship to see the adjacent jobs and see broader opportunities and go back and say, I see that now, I can dream it. So we need to do, we need to do, we do four things. Two well, two, if I can say, we need to do a better job. Our faculty are excellent at helping students gain knowledge and skills. But in addition, they need experience and relationships. And it's really through internships, work-based learning, things out in the community, things with summer jobs where they get experience and build new relationships. And then see, to your point, uh, the, the, the other jobs that are out there, the adjacent jobs, get to know the industry and open up their horizons. That's great, thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I know people might be wanting to ask. I just wanna follow up on, on top of resources and really giving a holistic approach to our students. Um, I came from a nonprofit job training, like unionized job training world where I always had to find the ways to make it the easiest way to get a trainee to show up or an apprentice to show up. And so I just, we haven't really touched on this at all, but this really doesn't um, directly correlate with our workforce programs and, and job training. What additional resources, if any, are you folks seeing at CUNY need to be supplemented for to have um, retention and to make sure people can participate within the job training programs? I'll, you know, childcare, uh, bilingual job training, stipends, transit vouchers, et cetera. Are you seeing influxes in that post pandemic? Are you seeing, um, you know, one more than other? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to answer at a high level. So yes, quite often the co-location of services for students alongside training or their degree is a necessity to move them into uh, the futures that they wanna be in. And in addition to some of the ones that you mentioned, transportation very often in our um, non-degree programs, we have subsidies for Metro cards, et cetera, if we're partnering with other agencies and funders to do that because we know that that's a barrier to getting to the job because even if you are being trained for a job in Queens, the job you might ultimately need to fill may be in Manhattan, may be in Brooklyn, may be elsewhere. So certainly transportation is a piece. You did hit on some of the other big ones, childcare, food insecurity is actually a huge mm. issue for our students. And so we've launched a number of partnerships to make sure across the university that our students have access to food um, across the board. Um, you know, there's, there's something that has really helped as well that isn't talked about as much when it comes to retention through programs. Part of that is like when it's delivered and how. So we're seeing prior to the pandemic, a very low percentage of our students participated in say career services or the kinds of services that could help them envision where they wanted to go in the future. Thanks to the pandemic, now even though we're, thanks to the pandemic, one of the <laughs> silver linings of the pandemic was now that we are back on campus, students are continuing to access those services that keep them engaged, um, but doing so at a higher level and doing so remotely through online supports. Um, and what we found in some of our degree programs is that when you pair academic advisement with that sort of career advisement, you see the time to graduation really go down and increase of persistence. So that's another realm where it's a supportive service that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but it is increasing thanks to new ways of delivering it alongside these programs. Um, I, I, I mean, uh, what we've heard is that um, there are these services at CUNY, um, particularly on the, on the degree side, on the non-credit side, on the job training side, where the funder has provided money for career services, for childcare, for transportation, uh, for, for snacks and, and food and so on. That works very well, but as, as President Adams mentioned, if you're paying for training yourself, you're doing it out of pocket, you don't get any of those services because all of the colleges are trying to keep 
the tuition as low as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. we, if we charge more for these services, people won't be able to take the training. So this is, I think, a huge gap and, and something that we would very much like to remedy at, at Lehman. Um, and that is sometimes possible at other colleges because they use grant funding for that, for that purpose, not quite, you know, anyway. Um, but it, that's a, a real lack for, for the certificate students who are paying out of pocket. Just, if I may just real quick, housing. Um, our biggest need, you know, our, our most critical need for students is affordable housing. I mean, the, we have a thing called LaGuardia Cares where they go for assistance. We had, last week I have two students sleeping in their cars. We have students in the shelter system. It's very hard to stay in school. Very hard. To, when things went online and you didn't have good Wi-Fi at the shelter, how are you going to keep up with class? Mm -hmm. So we're working. We've got to come up with some housing solutions. Remember, we don't have dorms. We're a quote-unquote commuter school. But we've got a lot of students who really have housing problems right now. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, last, last three questions, and we can be as brief as possible so we can move on to questions from colleagues. Um, has how is CUNY using its apprenticeship programs and other tools at its disposal to assist in the industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, including tourism, restaurants, retail, arts, and entertainment? Sure, absolutely. So um, currently, we are, as I mentioned before, uh, supporting apprenticeships in a number of ways. We are integrating them into our applied associates programs in some cases across five of our colleges. We're doing that because we think it's really important not just to do it in isolation, but to do it as part of a degree program. Mm -hmm. In those particular areas, they are mostly focused on uh, high demand uh, occupations that have been built directly with employers. We, to my knowledge, do not have any in tourism or hospitality or retail at the moment. We do have on the non-degree side um, a number of partnerships actually with SBS around something called First Course, which is for line cooks. That is essentially an accelerated training apprenticeship course. It is not a registered apprenticeship, but these um, students, I think it was delivered in partnership with Hostos and KBCC, have the opportunity to learn through an intensive training and then actually as part of their work get an on-the-job component, which is very similar. So these are efforts that are uh, occurring in different ways across our campuses that we are really starting to commit to scaling up across the board. We just received an additional $2 million from the state to do this work more at all 10 of our colleges that offer applied associates. And our employer partners are already talking about the hospitality industry as a potential area for expansion there. Great. Um, Two-fold question. How does CUNY interact with the Office of Workforce Development um, and the EDC, the Economic Development Corporation? And then if someone can, can touch on um, the, in 2020, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development and the Office for Economic Opportunity launched, launched a jobs portal website, um, working.nyc.gov. And I wanted to know if, uh, sorry, if uh, CUNY was included in the portal, if so, if there's any CUNY included data from the site that's tracked to see when job seekers uh, connect to employers. And yes, yeah, so we can start first off with interactions with workforce development and EDC. Sure, absolutely. So for the Mayor's Office of Workforce and Talent Development, we have regular standing meetings. I have been appointed the Chief Workforce Officer and therefore I am part of the interagency task force that the Mayor's Office of Workforce and Talent Development is running. Um, additionally, our chancellor co-chairs the Future of Workers Task Force, which the mayor and the Abby Jo Siegel are running as well. So we have regular and frequent interactions. In fact, I just came from a meeting with them, DOE and DYCD, right before this. Um, for NYC EDC, similarly, we have not only regular standing meetings, but also are working together day in, day out on actual implementation projects. Again, integration into the economic development initiatives that they're already doing, as well as they directly fund some of the work that we're doing across our campuses. For Climate Week, we just announced $4 million in partnership with them for green energy jobs, which is something that we're working on. For the NYC Opportunity data portal that you referenced, that includes a number of agencies that have submitted data to uh, a central portal. 
CUNY is currently not represented in that, and the reason for that is this challenge that we came back to that Chair Dinna was, um, was asking us about, which is we don't have a single system for collecting information for non-degree programs, mm -hmm. and a lot of the programs that are uh, mentioned in that particular database are really focused on accelerator training, industry-informed training, and that's the thing that we don't have capacity um, to report at scale across our campuses. However, we have had conversations with them about it, what the future would look like for a community to start contributing to that overall database. Great, thank you so much, and I'll yield my time. Thank you, I'm gonna turn it to Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me first say that I am a CUNY graduate. I have a bachelor's degree from Hunter College and an associates of science degree was back then Com New York City Community College, now it's Technical College. You know, my concern, and I've been chair of the Higher Education Committee for eight years, and I've heard this before. I've heard just about everything you can say about CUNY. And what I'm gonna focus on, because it's always left out, is black students and black faculty and black administrators. We should never, ever have a hearing where only white administrators are presenting. Not one black face is sitting up here making a presentation. 25 colleges, seven community colleges, you can't find one black administrator to give a perspective on black students and black faculty, this has to stop. It's unconscionable and unacceptable. And I also think that the chancellor should be at hearings like this. I appreciate your presence. But when we have hearings of this nature, I think it's very critical that the chancellor comes so we can see in addition to your CUNY-wide presentation, because now we're getting LaGuardia and Lehman, and then you give the perspective on the whole system. That's unacceptable for me. And I appreciate you. I'm not saying anything negative about you, but in addition to you, there needs to be a black face up there. And we need to point out black students. Because what happens, and I think you mentioned it, in our communities, you're talking homeless shelters, we're saturated with homeless shelters, and the black mayor is putting more in our community than the white community. So we're saturated with homeless shelters. The poverty rate in our communities, black and brown, is 33 to 40 percent poverty. The unemployment rate is double digit. So when you look at that factor and look how black students Black students fear in CUNY. What happens to black students if and upon graduation, do they get market rate salaries in career paths that they choose to be in? That's one question I would like. What is, what is the data on that? What are black students, how black students are faring, not just in CUNY, but upon graduation? You know, what, what do they get? And you know, <clears throat> when we look at the fact that we live in, whether y'all like it or not, we all probably do like it, a colonial capitalist system and its ideology that permeates every institution and in the minds of millions of New Yorkers is racism. That's the ideology. Capitalism is the system that creates the poverty and unemployment. So when the whole nation talks about unemployment coming down, not in our community. When they talk about all of these opportunities that people are having and how great programs are going, not in our communities. So I would like for us to have more focused attention on black students. Because when we talk about diversity, diversity, inclusion, diversity can mean anything. Diversity can exclude Blacks, as long as you diversify, got a woman, got Asians, got this one, got that one, you know, that's diversity. And I've been at hearings where they had diversity without a black person. So just as we, you spoke of the uh, free academy, whites, that's when it was free. Free academy, it was the white immigrants that came, there was no tuition, it was free, and they, 
because of their complexion, had access to social and economic mobility. And even when we were already here, so the white immigrants came, yeah, they were discriminated. They were called, they were called different names and stuff, but they had access to social and economic mobility, came at the bottom with us and went up. But now, it's tuition-based, it should be a free academy again. Now that we have all of this, and you know what? It could happen because all the money for TAP and all the money for, for all of these programs, if you took that money and put it in the, put it in the CUNY budget, that we can have a tuition-free academy and we should focus on those students. And I'm not saying other students aren't in need, but we should focus on black students because our perspective is usually neglected at these hearings or it's universally meshed in with everything else and you don't get a real picture. So the only question I have is how are black students fearing upon graduation in terms of market rate salaries in the areas of their choice? Thank you for that and do acknowledge that our panel is not reflective of our student body. Um, we don't have those numbers here today, but we are happy to look into them and get them to you afterwards. Okay, but well, that's what I usually hear, but I think these things are important, and you don't have them here today because that's not a priority for you. Your priority is what you presented, and this is why we need to focus on the black presence in CUNY. Faculty members are having problems getting, you know, going through the system so that they can have permanent employment. Tenure, thank you, I won't blink. <laughs> thank you. All right, I'm finished, but, but black faculties are having difficulty yes. getting tenure. That's ridiculous, 21st century. Black faculty having problems getting tenure. So we have all those kinds of issues in CUNY and they need to be seriously addressed. Thank, thank you. Thank you, council member, and I'll, I'll reiterate uh, the question just for the council member and the panel um, that earlier in my questioning we did add for, ask for the demographic data. I know those questions were sent to you uh, before the hearing, um, so we'll, we'll certainly make sure that those are shared with council member Barron, and I know I have complete faith you'll be able to send those to us. Um, I want to turn it over to council member Gutierrez. Thank you, Chair Dinowitz and Farias. Um, <clears throat> I apologize. I was in the district, but I was streaming it, so I did catch all of the um, your opening remarks. I just have some technical questions, if you could such, shed some light on. Um, I'm curious about the, the tech in res residence program and your opening remarks. You shared that your goal is to double it by 2022. Can you just share what that number is? Oh, so um, a couple of different things there. CUNY had something called CUNY 2X Tech. The goal was to double the number of tech bachelors awarded at CUNY by 2022. We did that. We um, managed to cross that threshold in four years instead of five. Tech in Residence Corps was a really important part of that solution. That brings industry professionals into the classroom to teach uh, in-demand topics, and that particular initiative has grown exponentially. I'm not sure that it's doubled over the same period of time, but it currently serves about 3,000 students. Across. And then the, the tech and bachelor's programs, what are those numbers? So our goal was to um, increase from, I think it was 995 to 2,000, and we exceeded that goal. Fantastic, and do you have any demographic information for those graduates? Again, not on us, but we can look into that. Yeah. I'm curious to know um, racial demographic, ethnic demographics, and also where they're, where they're coming from throughout the city, throughout the five boroughs. Um, my second question is, what are multiling multilingual students or non-English speaking students, how are they awarded access to some of these, these programs? How are they made aware at the different institutions of some of these incubators? Um, what does that specific outreach looks like? And, and what does a CUNY student, what are some of the qualifications that they need to be able to qualify to, to participate in these programs? Do you wanna take a stab at that, Kim? Yeah. Sure, I'll, let me answer, try to answer that, at least in the case of LaGuardia's uh, workforce training programs. Um, they're almost all taught in English. And we, we do lots of outreach all across Queens, of course, and we have several services that are helpful to students for whom English is still, you know, an mm -hmm. obstacle to a training program. One is this, um, a center for immigrant education and training that we run. 
where we help recently arrived immigrants in Queens, in many cases women with children, to, we train them or help them to navigate the DOE so they can become advocates for their small children um, in elementary schools, public schools. That activity gives us a chance to get to know them better and help them with jobs and employment and other issues as they transition into Queen's life. So we have the center. But the other thing I think that's most important that I mentioned it earlier is that LaGuardia is the largest provider of ESL, English as a Second Language Education in the city. Um, we've been doing it since 1971, um, 275,000 students. Uh, m m many, many different levels of English as a Second Language instruction including we are now one of the few remaining uh, intensive English programs, meaning you can get an F1 visa, right, to come to this country to learn English mm -hmm. with LaGuardia um, with that student visa. Um, those programs are expensive and intensive because it's so many hours per week, but we're a very large provider. So we have a wide range, and I'll just say finally, um, Coming out of the pandemic, we've had a huge surge in enrollment in our ESL programs, which has been very encouraging. And I think it's a lot of people who lost their jobs, who worked in low-wage, these were immigrants in Queens, who worked in low-wage service jobs. We're providing scholarships for them to come and learn English at the TELC. And our enrollment has surged. It was over 200% greater than a year ago. We had 400 students on a waiting list, unfortunately, because we didn't have enough instructors this summer. Um, so the, the first and foremost, we want to provide people with sufficient level of English so they can then take a workforce training program and go into a job where they're going to need to know enough yeah. English to do the job well. Yeah. My, my mom is actually one of the graduates from LaGuardia's ESL classes when they came here in the 80s. So I'm totally aware of how robust LaGuardia's uh, ESL program is and, and how, uh, how valuable it is to the non-English speaking community. So I guess just to make my question more specific, um, of those participants that are enrolled in some of the ESL programming, how are they then connected to some of these uh, tech opportunities and tech programs? Like what is the... And I'm, I'm encouraged to, to learn that a lot of folks have been enrolling since the pandemic. Um, I love hearing that. I think I would just love to understand what is the process for them to engage them in creating an opportunity for uh, pathways for some of these tech jobs. And then my last question before this runs out um, is I'm just curious to know if you can share some um, information on some more, uh, what are some of the your tech incubator goals for the rest, um, for some of the other communities? Um, obviously you have one in, I think in every borough, I think that's wonderful, um, but just curious to know if you have plans to, to expand those incubators. Thank you, thank you, Chairs. So um, you have the incubator. We have the incubator. <laughs> yes, um, the C city council-funded incubator at um, Lehman, also at the College of Staten Island in um, Queens, and I think uh, also in Brooklyn. Yep, just Queens. Just Queens. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you, Stacy. Um, and we are looking to expand in a variety of ways by getting other grant funded so that we can offer additional opportunities. Uh, I'd just like to follow up on, on what was said earlier about programs that link English as a second language with training, and we have the NCLEX training that, program that we are offering at Lehman at the moment, which starts off with intensive English language support to help people to get ready for the test, because that's what really what they need to pass. And then they're going to be registered nurses and goodness knows New York City needs more nurses. So we're linking the ESL with the training and then with the jobs. And I think that's a model that we would like to expand in a number of different areas. Thank you, Councilmember Gutierrez. Uh, Councilmember Williams. Hello. Um, my questions aren't, I guess, as succinct as others. Um, the first question I have, though, is you mentioned employee partners. Um, do you have like a list of employee partners that you can share? Like who are they and how they are recruited? Absolutely. So we don't have, I don't have in front of me a comprehensive list. No, yeah, the list to companies. send later, but just generally wanting to understand like. Who they are and how. how, how us. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So there's a twofold approach here. One is our individual campuses are working really closely with businesses all the time, all 25 of them, both locally, small businesses, as well as other corporate partners or otherwise. So there's that work that's happening on the campus and with these recent investments that I talked about, we're hoping that happens a lot more in a coordinated way. Additionally, there's a central office. Part of the challenge that we've heard from employers generally across the board in hiring CUNY students is that 
there are a million different doors. Getting to the place you need to be is really hard to navigate our system. So we have a central office of careers and in industry partnerships where any employer that is looking to connect with CUNY students are welcome to come. We have a website that has an intake form and we have a team that follows up with them to be able to then refer them to students on campuses that match what they are looking for. That is open to any employer partner, but we also do build specific partnerships, both with individual employers, but also with groups of employers. So the NYCEO Council is a great example. They have 30 of the largest employers here in New York City that we work with regularly, both for hiring of students and also for these more targeted investments like adding apprenticeships into applied associates programs. We also have some specific programs that are targeted not towards big businesses, but towards small businesses. In addition to our small business development centers, we also have some programs like internship to employment that um, recruits in students from across CUNY to uh, become interns in their senior or recently graduated year um, to be able to intern for six weeks before converting to full-time employees, at which point CUNY will actually subsidize those small businesses that hire them on. So there are a number of different channels that we work with employer partners. I'm wondering if you have any. So some of the, no, I just wanted to know general information, but just as a follow up, like for instance, the internship to employment program, is that a program that's offered at all CUNY schools or certain CUNY schools? Are you working with like the career office or is it like, how does that get trickled down to the many colleges you have? Yeah, great question. We have different models for doing that. Internship to employment specifically is open to any and all CUNY student that wants to participate. Um, and it is administered centrally in partnership with campus offices. That is not only career services, that can be partnerships at the provost or specific department levels, that could be partnerships with student um, services. It's very broad or even direct marketing to students because that's something that we can do as well. There are other programs like Career Launch that actually invests in specific campuses. LaGuardia is one of them, it's our healthcare hub, to build the capacity of a campus itself to build those partnerships across the board. And how do you make the decision like in determining which colleges um, are offered like the Career Launch Initiative? Is it like based off of um, a successful track record of doing other type of workforce development initiatives? Like how do you determine which colleges get what? Yeah, that's a great question. So in some of our programs, we have open RFPs. Absolutely any campus can apply, and then they are reviewed based on a variety of factors. Sometimes it is about a specific technical need or capacity that we need to offer for an employer, but other times it also has to do with ensuring that the portfolio of schools we select for programs that have a limited participation have geographic diversity across the five boroughs have a representation of community colleges and senior colleges. So depending on the program, there may be different considerations, but those are the high level things that we consider. Okay, and the Green Jobs um, initiative that you mentioned, the $4 million, um, is there a place, or can you send more information on that? Because I would love to know, again, is this like a central initiative or are specific colleges being tasked with implementing what it'll look like? Um, similar to the $16 million inclusive economy initiative, wanting to understand and get a little bit more details on um, the plan, scopes of work, like, you know, how will this be actually executed and implemented um, in a real way? So are you able to send that to me? Too? We can definitely send okay, it. Okay, cool. And then you said you're, you're a vice chancellor, but you're also chief workforce development officer? Yes, I'm an associate provost and oh. chief workforce development officer. Okay, really. associate provost and mm -hmm. chief workforce officer for New York City. So this is, or just through CUNY? For CUNY, yes. Okay, um, I just want to be clear on your say, scope. I'll take the Can I get like two more minutes? Okay, <laughs> um, great. So. Another question, comment I have, um, I used to work for the JFK Redevelopment Program and there is a lot of different types of opportunities there. Um, York College is in my district and in close proximity to the airport. The aviation program was started when the air train was built. Um, and so some of the things that I've been trying to do is figure out a way to create a specific workforce initiative that will support the I don't know, it's probably gonna be upwards of 18 plus billion dollar project at JFK. And so wanted to know, um, and this is why I'm asking these questions because I just wanna understand how CUNY, whether it's the college specifically or CUNY as a system, uh, is really working towards 
an actual pipeline, like here is the opportunity and how can we utilize the programs and services at our existing colleges to funnel people to opportunity. So even going to the DOE, there is York Early College Academy also in my district. Um, and so how can we even start in high school? Um, there's another CTEA, not in my district, but a career technical engineering architectural high school. How can we utilize that particular high school to funnel um, our young folks into a continuing education program? Maybe they don't wanna get a four-year degree or a two-year degree, they just want a certificate for construction. I know LaGuardia has a lot of construction programs. Or maybe they do want an aviation degree at your college, but if you could just share how these decisions are made and what opportunities exist to really online um, very specific programs that I do feel will have a lot of potential. Sure, so the way we are approaching it now is twofold. If JFK were to come to us tomorrow, just as an example, to CUNY Central at the systems level, we need to have a door they can come in that understands their needs and then connect them out to the schools that have aviation programs. In this case, York is really uh, the leading contender there. Um, so there has to be some way that centrally we can have that kind of conversation with opportunities that come to us. But equally important is we are making an investment locally in campuses so that they can build out this infrastructure themselves to work with JFK in their own backyard in the case of York. And those kinds of partnerships really have to be specific to what the job opportunities are. So there isn't like a one size fits all systems approach to mapping out um, these are the general parameters. It really has to be what is the employer looking for in this particular case to know, can we go to high schools to see if students can plug into this pipeline? Or are these jobs actually jobs where if someone were to get a non-credit certificate, the employer would actually hire them. So there's a process that we go through both centrally and locally, but those are resources that absolutely are needed more. Like our campuses need more capacity to be able to do that. Um, and separately, I was just on the phone with the aviation department at York the other day, so we should talk more about this at this Dr. Time. Sue? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I believe so. Okay, yeah, because, so just transparently, like, you know, the JFK Redevelopment Program, there is this idea that there will be a community benefit fund that's paid by the Port Authority and the terminal developers, but my thing is, one, we always can use more money, and there's existing money in different spaces, whether it's the $14 million or the $4 million, or I was just informed of um, an RFP at the state level for additional money for workforce development programs, and how can we cross-coordinate all of this activity and resources to stand up, again, like a specific program and initiative, so I will make sure to come and talk to you about that um, and get your information. And just quickly, like the SUNY EOCs, oh, I have to wrap it up, the SUNY EOCs, um, how are you interacting with the SUNY EOC? So your college has a SUNY EOC sort of connected to them, but it's separate and aside. So how are you kind of leveraging SUNY EOCs and you know, using that as a, as a workforce development tool through CUNY? Neither one of you have, has an EOC, right? Not now. Okay. So um, York is not the only example. Obviously, BMCC also has an EOC. And in those specific cases, we actually are coordinating with SUNY more broadly. SUNY has a counterpart in their system the same way that we have in ours. And we are regularly coordinating to um, work together on policies that leverage the things we have on the ground. So for instance, we're working together on things like financial aid for workforce credentials. In the case of the, EOC, the EOCs, right now that collaboration happens largely locally within campuses that have that particular resource on their campus. So I know there's a lot of coordination at BMCC between those particular teams, the non-credit teams that are CUNY run and the SUNY team, um, because we don't want to have the case where particular uh, leads or capacity or needs are not being met when two teams that can meet them sit right next to each other. So we have been trying to improve that coordination. Thank you, Chairs, for the time, and thank you so much for your answers. Thank you, Councilmember Williams. Councilmember Riley. Thank you, Chair Dinowitz and Chair Farias. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just one question. Um, being that uh, cannabis is going to be a big market that's coming into New York City, um, I know Mega Evers has a program there, but is CUNY looking to expand uh, workforce development in cannabis? Um, it's going to be a $5 billion business, and we want to make sure that everyone's as educated um, and has the same opportunities as everyone else. And from my colleague, Councilmember Williams, uh, she asked a question about the corporation. I know you don't have a list, but are any of those corporations um, in cannabis or have any work to do with cannabis? Thank you. 
Can I take? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I love your question because this is something <coughs> that we're particularly interested in. <coughs> Excuse me, at uh, Lehman. Um, we've been following what's happened with the M MRTA since it was passed in March last year. And uh, we off started in January offering a, a certificate with a, a university in Canada, since Canada is you know, three to four years ahead of us. Um, we are now offering, um, we're, we're offering training to small businesses who have received licenses. As you know, the process is that people, have, the legacy entrepreneurs have applied for licenses. Uh, from the Bronx, about 30 have been submitted by uh, through through the Bronx defenders who've been supporting the legacy entrepreneurs once they get their their licenses we anticipate that they would then come to Lehman College to CUNY on the concourse where they would have space support services uh, an address and so on and we would help them with their um, their uh, business plans and with setting up their business and we we're doing that with a grant from the Department of Labor uh, in conjunction with the Borough of Manhattan Community College, which is doing training uh, in three areas, in security guard, retail, and um, uh, processor. And we are working with a bunch of different organizations within the city, with state agencies, city agencies, all sorts of organizations, such as the uh, Bronx Community Foundation, as I said, the Bronx Defenders, the Bronx Cannabis Hub, and various other um, uh, CBOs and at this point uh, as you know the, the goal is that the rollout of the businesses on the recreational side will not be big businesses the intention is that it will be small businesses so since that's one of our areas of expertise we are looking to provide small business uh, uh, support so we have a, currently this relatively small grant of 200,000 a year for three years but we're looking for other funding so we can expand this opportunity. Is, is that 200,000 to spend each year or is that yeah, throughout the, each, oh, each, each year? year. Okay. And then um, uh, BMCC has 400,000 for the training. So, I mean, not, not a large grant, but something that will become central for this pilot and that we, we in, would like to expand. We'd love to talk more and see if we could be um, some of assistance, but thank you so much for your answer. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you, Council Member Riley. Um, I, I'd like to note we've been joined by Council Member Aviles. Uh, next question, uh, next uh, is Council Member Kagan. Thank you so much. First, I would like to comment on the statement by my col colleague, uh, Council Member Charles Barham. He spent like about five minutes, five minutes teaching everybody about socialism, capitalism. So I came from the socialist country to America. I came from the former USSR. I lived in a country where we had huge lines for food and it was a big deficit of a simple food, you know. So that's socialism. And I don't see huge immigration from America to socialist countries. A lot of people from America immigrating to Venezuela, North Korea, etc. I don't see this uh, movement. That's number one. Number two, talking about blacks and whites and everybody else. As you noticed, I am a little bit white. I came to America with no money, no English. Like this country created a huge opportunity for my family, and I'm a proud graduate of CUNY of Baruch College. My son uh, studied at Baruch College and then transferred to Vanderbilt University. My daughter is right now in CUNY College, Brooklyn College. This country gave us everything. And talking about diversity, CUNY is one of the most, most diverse bodies in the country. Like I know it as a former student, I know like I see in, in Brooklyn College particularly, you know, like so, and the topic of this hearing is workforce development. He did not even ask one question about workforce development. I believe this is the best way for all communities of New York City. And by the way, this city council led by African-American speaker, first time in the history of New York City, we have an African-American female speaker, Adrian Adams. So this council represents everybody, every single community, and workforce development is very, very important. So my question is, how do you partner with communities where all CUNY campuses and all CUNY colleges are located? Because just this week, I talked to Kingsborough Community College in Southern Brooklyn, and I noticed that like they do work in some way, shape, or form, but they do not really partner with community organizations because they spend most of their time inside college. And as you notice, communities are usually outside of colleges. So 
do you have any program? How do you partner with community organizations to improve our workforce development for everybody? Thank you. But well, we, we, we are out there. Thank you for this comment and, and, and um, for your question. Um, the, the way that we partner, we think of ourselves at Lehman College School of Continuing and Professional Studies as the bridge. We're the bridge into the community. We go to community events. We're part and parcel of, of all that's going on in, in the Bronx and in Upper Manhattan and in Lower Westchester. And, and that's really our goal is to be part of, of what's happening, whether it's a fall festival, whether it's a DOE um, conference, whatever it might be, we're there in force to make sure that we know what's happening in the community. And, and that's how we do it. Our, our college is a Hispanic serving institution. It's a minority serving institution. We have about 55% Hispanic, about 35% African American and black students. Um, and and we, we reach out to all of those communities in all sorts of ways, shapes, and forms. And that's, that's what we see as our goal. And going back to the larger question about outreach, in addition to having you know, the website and, and the catalog and all of the sort of social media marketing, we, we also are part and parcel of what's going on in the Bronx. And we're, we're at everything. Um, Thank you. I b again, I believe that workforce development is the best way to yeah. to help all communities. You know, like, and like, we need more partnership with community organizations, not just inside the office, but even outside the offices. That's right. Thank you, Councilmember Kagan. Councilmember Avilas. Good afternoon. Apologies for missing the early part of the presentation. And forgive me if you've covered any part of this. Um, I represent District 38 in South Brooklyn, which includes uh, the neighborhoods of Sunset Park and Red Hook, which are waterfront communities with um, certainly at one point a very robust industrial waterfront. Um, as we are reimagining our waterfront into a healthier, greener industry, one of the things, obviously, with the coming of um, the largest um, windmill assembly, wind power, in Sunset Park, one of the things we've identified, obviously, is the workforce pathways to this new industry. I'd love to know, you know how the EDC, who has a pretty significant footprint in the district, um, and the CUNY is preparing for green reindustrialization in our communities. Sure, I'll come in an assistance level, and then I know, Ken, you all are doing some work on this too. Um, so last month for NYC Climate Week, we announced together with EDC, CUNY and EDC, about $4 million of city investment in green energy jobs, including offshore wind. And some of those investments, about 2.9 million, I believe, was in um, the capital investments that are needed to build the infrastructure to do green workforce development. So for instance, at Kingsborough Community College, investing in renovating the CUNY's only seafaring vessel to do uh, maintenance of offshore wind facilities. So we are actively partnering with EDC to know what they are projecting um, will come into the area, how they are expecting to work with developers around jobs, and then we are actively investing to build that infrastructure as those jobs come in to make sure that folks can have access to them. Is this the resources that have been allocated through the Sunset Park Task Force through the EDC, or are these additional resources? I'd have to defer to them on that. I can give you a good afternoon a local example from, it's not specific, I apologize, to Sunset Park or Red Hook, but at least for Long Island City, uh, which Faces, or has some of the similar, similar opportunities. Um, and I would be remiss in mentioning this if I didn't thank uh, our council member, the Honorable Julie Wan, who represents LaGuardia, the Queen's delegation, and indeed Speaker Adams for the capital funding we get in this current year budget, which will enable us to build a climbing tower for training of people interested in careers in maintaining turbines and other offshore wind generating equipment. Um, this tower, you should see, CUNY doesn't normally build something like this. It's tricky and it's complicated, but we're going to do it. And we're going to do it with the support of Council Member Juan and the rest of you. Uh, and that's because we have these opportunities uh, with the repowering of Ravenswood, the old Con Ed plant, right, under its new ownership, Rise Light and Power, uh, which will be bidding uh, on the NYSERDA contracts for, is to be part of the supply system. We'll see if they win, right? But. Uh, to be one of the points of contact for power generated offshore. 
And should that happen in Sunset Park or other, you know, obviously various places are bidding on this, but we, the answer is we, yes, are preparing uh, training programs in cooperation with these organizations and NYSERDA and EDC for workforce opportunities in these green industries that are right, right before us. Well, that's exciting, and I'd love to see it in District 30. You, if, you, <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're willing to put on a climbing harness and a helmet, we can get you up to the 30 Absolutely. foot, the platform Absolutely. at the top. Um, yeah, no, I think, I, you know, I think we, we are a community, obviously, that has long memories of working on the industrial waterfront, and so, you know, any opportunities to get our young people on track um, for those jobs, particularly when Equinor opens up um, the assembly, we absolutely would love those opportunities. And certainly I'd be remiss if I, I didn't say I would love to have a, a CUNY site in our district so our residents didn't have to travel f so far and I'd love it to be free, but nevertheless, um, thank you for that investment. I think it is a serious one that we, we need to make sure that our young people and our residents currently who you know, don't have a, 40% of our community don't even have a high school diploma, but they have great technical um, abilities, and uh, these are perfect jobs for our health and well-being as an environmental justice community as well. So thank you for that work, and I look forward to more specifics and climbing the tower, apparently. Thank you, Councilmember Viles. I have two quick follow-ups to uh, <coughs> some of the points Councilmember Fadi uh, Co-Chair Faria said. Um, one is, to students who are doing not uh, matriculated, not doing credit bearing, just you know the, the training that you do. Do they have access to the same food pantries and the same services like um, like you have employees who help students access SNAP benefits, HRA, etc. Do, do the people engaged in the workforce development and the certificates, the micro credentials, do they have the same access to those services as students who are uh, otherwise you know full time students? I want to hear the official answer before I give you the unofficial answer. <laughs> um, it varies, and we do not have a policy that says that those services must be made available to all non-degree seeking students. Can, can you make it a policy? I mean, that's talking about some of the issues, the food, food justice, food security, housing, that we're so concerned about with full-time students. Couldn't those be made available to anyone who's engaged at CUNY, regardless of whether the full-time or non-credit-bearing certificate, micro-credentials, what have you? Say yes, please. <laughs> I'll give you, it, it's complicated, sorry to put it that way. Um, where we raise the funds privately, for example, donations to our LaGuardia Cares program for the food bank or housing, you know, our LaGuardia Foundation, right? All the colleges have a 501c3 foundation, a separate fundraising arm. So the funds we raise there, at least at LaGuardia, we use for all students. That's how we're able to provide scholarships now for students who want to start by learning ESL or getting a GED or get, get training. But those are privately raised funds, and that's because we just did a fundraising campaign in the spring. We raised $15 million, very generous donors. Congratulations. And, and we're doing that. But that's LaGuardia. Here's the complicated part. Students who are in degree programs, matriculated students, pay at least in a community college, the tuition is $2,400 a semester plus fees. Those fees, like the student tech fee, come to the college and enable us to provide a certain amount of services to those degree students because they paid the fee. As an example, students in workforce training programs, non-credit students, don't pay the tech fee. So there's some services we have to order the degree, the student who's paid the tuition, whether that's their own cash or with financial aid, they're entitled to certain services, and the services who, are not, who haven't paid that full tuition and fees, you have to find other ways to provide them. The, now, then there's a workaround. You want to go to the library? We'll let you in the library. You want, you know, there's plenty of things you can do, but our childcare facility, for example, some of these things, the way they're funded means the first people who get to use them are those people who paid for them. That's so the complication. Right. So I, I'm referencing, you know, we had a hearing, uh, I think it was our second hearing we had, was about these single stop successor programs where it was a single stop to access HRA benefits, other health benefits, apply for SNAP, apply for ha what, whatever have you, and you've since moved to a more uh, dispersed model, but I would hope that Central CUNY recognizes that students, regardless of what program you're in, whether you're paying that fee or not, do need access to housing and the food pantry and all sorts of other things in order to be successful in the other parts of their education. And the last question I have um, regards, follows up on Council, um, Chair F uh, Farias's question about city workers. Um, 
I guess when there's a private industry, it feels like the company has decided that this is the direction, this is the number of slots we need, the number of, there, there's a vacancy, there are vacancies in this particular field with these particular skills. In city government, there's often, let's say, disagreement between, for example, uh, the council and the administration as to the number of, I don't know, housing, you know, housing inspectors there needs to be or something, or what, what, you know, what we need more of in the city and where we should be focusing our, our efforts. So when you are working with the city and when they are telling you the needs that they have the city, who's sort of the final arbiter of what the needs are in New York City? Is it a holistic approach listening to what we're saying about our local communities? Or is it the executive branch, the mayoral administration kind of fi in finality telling CUNY, look, we need more of, of this field? So at the systems level, we have a couple of different ways that we approach that. One is, as I mentioned before, we do work with DCAS to understand what the actual hiring projections are, regardless of who decides who, who should be hired where. Um, we also work with 16 agencies through our CUNY internship program, which means that we are directly working with the agencies to understand where they project to uh, be needing to hire people and where they're seeing vacancies where they would really like to bring people in. We also have separate efforts um, through something called the Edward T. Rogowski program to work directly with council members and other legislative uh, bodies like assembly members or state senate members to ensure that we are helping to get folks into their offices, but the decision-making apparatus, we sort of are much more technical on the ground to understand from the agencies directly who they anticipate hiring. Okay, right, so, oh, so that, and that answers my question, actually. All right, I'd like to... Uh, I, just have, I just have one quick one. So I know, uh, coming from the nonprofit side, whenever we did registered apprenticeships with, like, the Department of Labor, uh, uh, it also went all the way up to like state, federal government, and there were training dollars that we would get back as a nonprofit organization for every single hour where we were training people in whatever sector. Does CUNY have um, a re like a, sh a stream of funding that is connected that way um, for any of the job training that you do or the unionized upskilling or curriculums you are, are training folks for? Um, so I'll let my colleagues who are directly working with unions talk about their arrangements there. We do have state funding streams that come to CUNY every single year. Um, it's about 5.88 total. Um, and that's like a dollar to dollar match or something like that? Uh, actually, those are usually structured as a straight out grant, not a matching grant. Um, but those are the kinds of programs, one of them is for apprenticeships that we leverage to help our campuses do that work. Chair Farias, I would add that you know, the unions themselves are good indicators of workforce need. In other words, if you take the training and employment fund of SEIU 1199, which is a very big and sophisticated and well-funded workforce training organization, um, they are, because they are on the ground at all the healthcare providers you know, across the city with their members working in those organizations, they know where the training needs are and can often tell us in CUNY, again, the union leader, the, the leadership of these training funds. I mentioned the cafeteria workers from DC 37. Um, they're very good at letting us know where they see changes in the municipal workforce, you know, for their members because they're having retirements or because uh, they're new opportunities. Um, so I think there's sort of three levels here. One is, yes, CUNY is so well positioned to do workforce training for positions and good jobs and careers all across city government. You've got DCAS and you've got, you know, the, the sort of civil service, really the, 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 the agency level employers in the civil service system, which can make things complicated. And finally, of course, and importantly, you've got the unions as the intermediary and they really have a sense of where the needs are. If I can just make sort of one suggestion um, or an observation, it goes back to the idea of like get on your phone and look for you know Google the question of um, you know getting a getting job training, you know Google the question of working for the Department of Sanitation or something. It, it's it's it can be made it can be f for someone who's not familiar with getting a city job, like many of our students, first gen immigrants. It can be really complicated to sort of figure out how do I get a job at a city agency. 
Um, and, I th and I think a lot of the, and I often question some of the credential requirements across government. I think most of you are familiar with this when we spoke about it at the recent Cuff conference that Governor Larry Hogan this summer down in, in Maryland took, I think, three or 400 state job titles that always had required a baccalaureate degree and threw that requirement out the window, which opened up several thousand jobs to people in Maryland who only had associate's degree or high school diplomas. They could now apply for these jobs in, in Maryland government because he just removed that barrier. He said, you don't need a bachelor's degree for this particular position. And I think a scrubbing of credential requirements across city jobs um, and, and could be, we might see opportunities to reduce barriers to employment for many, many people in this city. If they could indeed do the job without a baccalaureate degree or a, you know, a traditional credential, even an associate degree. So I'd like to give you a couple of examples from um, Lehman of uh, programs that we have with, il with 1199. Um, when 1199 needs some short-term quick training, they come to us for us to do um, a, a, some kind of a, an, an upgrade, for example, patient care technician, something like that. So we might have a relatively small grant to serve, let's say, 60 uh, union members with particular training. But we also have a, um, a sort of bridge program whereby union members can come into our adult degree program and you should have got a copy of It's Never Too Late to Earn a Degree, right? Um, and uh, so they, they come into our adult degree program and then if they've got some credits already, then they're going to um, finish their degree. If not, they'll start as freshmen. And so we have quite a, a, a large grant with them to facilitate um, all of that. I'm going to throw out a wrinkle that we haven't talked about undocumented New Yorkers. And um, we would have a whole lot more people in jobs if we didn't require them to be documented. I believe that in, in California, this is currently under discussion um, as to whether people are required to be documented to get to be employed. So I'm just throwing that out there because that, that's the sort of thing that really affects um, database management. If you require peop people to have a social security number to be in a database so that you can track outcomes, if they don't, then you're going to lose those people. Either they won't enroll for that uh, grant-funded training or, or you're going to simply not have them there. And that's one of the attractions of tuition-based um, training programs is that you're not required to, to give anybody your social security number. So I, I don't, that's just kind of food for thought. Yeah. Since you've given us a huge amount to think about, I'm <laughs> lobbying the ball back to you. Well, thank you for that. I think that's also a very timely um, thing to bring up, and I appreciate you bringing that to the forefront. Undocumented workers, especially with what we're seeing with the migrant asylum seekers that are coming into the city that's and work right. authorizations and how um, at all levels of government right now, we really have to work together to expedite for people's safety and um, just living standards. Uh, but I appreciate that, and we will take that back and think about our own homework to work on. But thank you for entertaining my last question. I would like to thank this uh, panel for, for, answering, for uh, presenting and for answering our questions, and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And the next panel will be called. The committee is now called Juana Franklin Davis, uh, Siobhan Kavanaugh, and John Williams. Oh, okay. Well, you can. I'll keep it. Can I have a suit? Please raise your right hand.
Never mind. No. Just wanted to, Simon didn't say. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Please make sure to introduce yourself before you begin your testimony. Thank you. Dawana Franklin Davis, CEO of Reboot Representation. Good afternoon, chairs, chairpersons, Dinowitz and Ferris and other members of the Committee on Higher Education and Committee on Economic Development. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony before you on workforce development opportunities at the City University of New York. My name is Dawana Franklin Davis. I'm the CEO of Reboot Representation. We are a coalition of 21 companies in the technology space with the mission to double the number of black, Latina, and Native American women graduating with computing degrees by 2025. The coalition was born on the heels of a report that identified the lack of investment in black, Latina, and Native American women graduating with computing degrees. So for brevity, we say BLNA as the acronym. In 2017, we surveyed 32 technology companies. Those organizations represented 500 billion in revenue, 500 million in philanthropic giving, and they were only spending 5% of that funding on women and girls in tech. Less than 0.1% went to black, Latina, and Native American women and girls in tech. So in 2017, that 0.1% was $335,000. That's it. We also examined who was graduating with computing degrees through the National Center for Education Statistics Clarification of Instructional Programs, also known as SIP. Um, and Code 11, which represents computing and information sciences and support services. So BLNA women represented 4% of the graduating population, and that number was down by nearly 33% over the previous decade. And that number also wasn't projected to double to 8% into the year 2052 without interventions. So the companies that participate in the coalition know that no one company created the inequities that we see in tech today, and no one company can fix it alone. The power of their collective action and pooled investment through the coalition allow us to invest in nonprofit programs and initiatives while making systemic changes that will impact the least represented in the technology space. As our country and city continue to recover from the pandemic, and as we brace for the looming recession, CUNY is primed to focus on workforce development and enable our citizens not only to thrive, but also to help New York lead the global economy. The last two years have shown that all of us that tech transcends industry and that all pathways through the schools should reflect that. The diversity of CUNY schools and their programs should reflect the communities that they serve and the rich diversity of the city. In order to understand the baseline, baseline foundation and design programs and initiatives with this goal in mind, CUNY must collect and disaggregate data both by race and gender, at the very least, and treating students not as a monolith, but providing programs that will serve the masses. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Williams, CEO of RealWorks, um, and Siobhan, we're gonna do this together. We're gonna share our time. Um, my name is John Williams. I am the co-founder and CEO of RealWorks, a Brooklyn-based youth arts and career development nonprofit that has mentored and trained thousands of young New York filmmakers citywide through in-school, after-school, CASA, and workforce programs for over 20 years. Our uh, today, our testimony is about Media Makers, RealWorks' partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment and CUNY to build a media workforce that reflects the talent, diversity, and um, drive of New York City. Uh, my name is Siobhan Cavanaugh, and I am the Career Exploration Program Manager of Media Makers, overseeing our internship program, which will place 100 CUNY students into paid media internships in 2023. Through Media Makers, CUNY students um, explore careers through multiple paid internships over a two to three year period, combined with workforce readiness training, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and industry-backed credentials. We partner with over 80 employers, including major studios like Paramount, Warner Brothers, Discovery, NBC Universal, Netflix, and Amazon. 
What began as a work, a work readiness initiative has become a jobs program with 87% of our graduates securing employment within 12 months of graduation. Today, we are exploring, seeking, asking for new funding um, to expand Media Makers to reach additional 100 CUNY students annually. To date, Media Makers has served 154 CUNY students from 17 campuses who have completed nearly 300 paid internships. Students like Frida Gonzalez, a Brooklyn College student who wanted to work in media but was not sure where to start. Frida joined Media Makers in 2020. In a year and a half, she experienced three internships, starting with small production companies and finally landing at a global media company, Radical Media. Throughout these internships, Frida attended classes in workforce readiness training, received one-on-one -on -one coaching on how to interview for jobs, and attended career roundtables to learn about all of the different jobs in the entertainment industry. When she graduated, she was still very nervous about finding a job, but thanks to Media Makers, Frida had knowledge, experience, a resume of success, and a network of professionals in the industry to help her land a full-time job as a production assistant at Showtime last year. Frida is one of 30 CUNY Media Makers students who entered the workforce this past year, 87% of whom are working full-time at companies like Showtime, Paramount, Disney, Warner Bros, and Warner Bros Discovery for starting salaries ranging from 30 to 60 grand. Media Makers works. This year, the mayor's office has renewed its support will enable 100 CUNY students like Frida to explore careers in media entertainment. We're looking to double that number. We're, we're currently seeking to raise $350,000 to pay internship salaries and add additional internship coordinator to serve a total of 200 CUNY students this year. Our three-year partnership with CUNY has proven the effectiveness of our approach, and we look forward to expanding our reach to provide opportunities for talented young New Yorkers to explore careers in New York City's $82 billion entertainment industry. And just a quick follow-up question. You, here you have in your testimony that the mayor's office renewed its support, enabling 100 students to be a part of Media Makers. What's that budgetary amount? What's the allocation for 100? Um, it's about 400,000, um, roughly. It splits between RealWorks and CUNY. RealWorks gets the funding that pays for the salaries, um, and CUNY gets um, about half the funding to pay for um, um, uh, a staff member and over wraparound support based in Brooklyn College. The program is moving from CUNY Central to Brooklyn College this year. Okay, and the 350 that you're seeking, 350,000 that you're seeking, yes. um, it goes to the, would be a total pot split between yourself, RealWorks, and CUNY, or 350K for RealWorks to expand the, the program? I would seek it directly to RealWorks. It would, would allow us okay. to um, hire for um, less money frankly, and put more money into the um, uh, pockets of the students to make sure they get their experience. Thank you. Um, so, so you, can you, can, can both of you, I, great pair, I loved your script. It's great, it was like a whole routine. But can you both spoke, about, so you spoke about the collaboration with CUNY in terms of serving CUNY students. Um, Ms. Franklin Davis, can you speak, can you please speak about not just the work you do, but how you collaborate with CUNY or how CUNY collaborates with you to, um, provide the to, to help you and provide the services you provide? Sure. We don't actually collaborate with CUNY yet. Can you talk a little more about that? Um, so we reboot with our mission is specific to serving black, Latina, and Native American women because they are the least represented in the TAC population. And uh, in the it's, uh, and reboot was launched in 2018. An early program that we funded was called um, Women in Technology New York, now called Breakthrough Tech New York, which is a program that came out of, CU out of CUNY um, or in collaboration with CUNY. We did fund that. Um, but it is very challenging from our, our perspective to be able to work with the CUNY schools because we need data. And we're big on being able to collect and disaggregate that as we want to focus on the least represented in the population. And so um, at this point in time, there hasn't been a program that we've been able to fund. Oh, so, so, well, it sounds like you're asking for the same thing that we were asking. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. No? I'm sorry, can you say No, I said, I said it, it sounds like you have similar concerns that we in the committee had earlier when we were asking for um, certain data points and, and how it's disaggregated about race, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, but is, is that the only holdup, making sure that you can, you know, I don't know, you know, address your, your mission, that you're not sure, because CUNY doesn't disaggregate the data, um, it, it doesn't 
it's difficult for you to do the work that you're seeking to do. Is the data the only holdup? It also takes real partnership and collaboration. So data is one because we have to, Reboot is funded from corporations. And so that's the funding that we use to give to nonprofit institutions. And so we have to report back to them. We also, because we're big on data, work with a measurement and evaluation form, uh, firm. And with regards to that, um, there's obviously some data privacy and sharing agreements that have to, um, we, we have to agree on in order to be able to say what data can we share. Obviously, um, not, not I identifying students um, is something that's key and important. Um, in addition to that, um, more than 75% of the funding that we provide for a program or initiative needs to go towards BLNA women. And so I think that also could be challenging for CUNY to say how many BLNA women are in a specific program or a pathway um, that can be supported by an initiative. Well, I'm certainly interested in, um, you know, after this hearing, talking with you more and CUNY as they're developing their data system and collecting this important data should you know probably be listening to the people who are doing the the difficult work of of workforce development um so we should certainly uh discuss after the hearing kind of as cuny is building from the ground up the valuable data that they can centralize and collect uh, i want to thank you for joining the panel and thank you for your for your um testimony today thank you The committees now call Priscilla Treyu and Shweb Fadi. Welcome, and would you just please state your name before you start your testimony? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Priscilla True, and I am currently a senior at Queens College. I am double majoring in psychology and communication sciences and disorders with a minor in linguistics. Um, after I graduate in December, I plan to pursue a master's degree in speech pathology um, in the future, I would like to serve my local community by delivering speech therapy to children with um, speech and language delays and developmental disabilities and supporting their families. Prior to CUNY career launch, it was difficult for me to find a job relevant to my field without much related work experience. However, through CUNY career launch, I had a paid internship in the healthcare field of my choice which also allowed me to develop lasting connections and a stronger professional network. The Career Launch program has played an instrumental role in my success and has propelled my professional career by providing me with an internship at an early intervention agency, as well as professional development, financial literacy, and mental wellness workshops. During my internship, I learned about the professional expectations, paperwork, and billing processes that the field of speech language pathology entails. I believe this knowledge will help me to become a well-rounded clinician in the future. Career Launch has also led me to my current um, employment position where I will be working as an administrative assistant for another CUNY internship program, the Spring Forward Program at LaGuardia Community College. The support I received from CUNY Career Launch has been unmatched and I am extremely grateful for the opportunity that I was given this past summer. I truly hope that the program continues in the future so that other undergraduate students may have those opportunities as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shai Fadeli, um, and I'm a Kingsborough Community College uh, student. Um, my major is business administration. Um, actually, I moved to New York uh, three years ago, and when I moved here, I didn't speak no English, and I had to um, learn by my own. And actually, um, from a friend, I've learned about one of the programs that um, CUNY offered, which is CLIP program, CUNY Language Immersion Program, which helped me a lot in terms of um, improving my language, specifically academic language, uh, when it comes to um, reading books and um, you know writing essays, 
And I believe um, thanks to this program, I've literally improved my English to the point that I'm, I didn't struggle when I took my credit classes and also I get A pluses on both of my English classes. Um, so last summer, uh, thanks to CUNY, I had the chance to be part of the career lunch program, which gave me an opportunity to um, apply what I'm learning about business um, in, in a real experience. And I've had the chance to uh, intern in the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. Um, I was working with a team uh, that we were working on helping small businesses to improve throughout the borough. Um, I, was, I had the experience to attend different meetings it just because it was my first, um, first internship and it was my first um, office job. Like I've always, I've never like had an office job experience. It was a great chance for me to um, learn how to be in a meeting and how to participate and how to um, engage in a, in a professional conversation. Um, we also were doing field trips to different businesses where I had to engage with uh, um, businesses owners and s speak to them about the program and what the program offer, like the different resources. So um, actually, this was a great um, chance for me to get off like the, the only the class experience. I had to like, it, you know, be a, I feel like I'm a business person in reality, just not like doing homework. Like I felt that, like when I was taking classes, it was more of like taking classes, doing homework and that's it. But thanks to this internship, I had the chance to practice uh, um, and learn a lot of skills. And I do hope this kind of opportunities keep, you know, keep, um, happening because us like especially like me as an immigrant and somebody who like didn't learn um didn't speak english when i moved here we do need these opportunities so we could um so we could succeed in the future thank you so much thank you so much for your testimony uh, and congratulations really looking forward to see what the two of you do uh, in the future thank you so much our next panelist is Gerardo Fields. Whenever you're ready. My name is Gerardo Shields. I'm the Dean of the School of Technology and Design at City Tech where we're over 6,000 strong. Good afternoon, members of the Committee on Economic Development, Committee on Higher Education, my fellow CUNY colleagues, and engaged community stakeholders. To share a tagline that my communications design colleague, Professor Douglas Davis, coined, City Tech is the public path to possible. Our industry partners and employers celebrate our diversity and our unique program offerings. For example, the American Institute of Architects, AIA Brooklyn, proudly featured our first graduating class of architectural students in their fall 22 publication of Pylon, which you have a selection of as part of your packet. And the diversity speaks for itself, or you should have a copy of the packet. I can flip for it and show you. It is there. Since 2010, New York State Department of Transportation has hired over 150 City Tech interns through their Transportation Construction Inspectors Program. Last year, 35 City Tech interns were hired, and that was 46% of the total hired by uh, DOT. And uh, Chair Farias, I just want to, you had mentioned, I'm going off script for a second, you had mentioned adjacency. Of those 35 students, 17 found full-time employment through the contractors and the consultants that DOT was working with. So it was that exposure. And again, they were hired because we offer certifications through continuing ed that our other sister and sibling organizations don't offer, such as the ACI and OSHA. Our reach goes beyond the built environment and into the digital experience. City Tech answers the call of Industry 4.0 with offerings in cybersecurity, cloud computing, additive manufacturing, augmented reality, big data and analytics, autonomous robots, and simulation. 
we all need to reframe how we view digital technology because it permeates all industries and professions. Our technology can do the work faster, more efficiently, and precisely, and retains a wealth of knowledge. And if you don't believe me, just ask Alexa. So what is it that we as humans still bring to the table? Creativity, critical thinking, and craft. For over a decade now, we have worked in partnership with the Brooklyn Navy Yard to support their 500 plus businesses in the technology and industry sectors. Nearly 200 of our students are employed in various capacities at the Navy Yard annually. On behalf of City Tech, please allow me to express our gratitude to the Council for their most recent financial support to strengthen this collaboration with the Navy Yard's talent. EY recognized the importance of technology and finance, and AP Anderson mentioned this earlier. Last year, EY piloted an internship program with our Computer Information Systems Associate students, which resulted in full-time hire. Just this week, our Construction Management and Civil Engineering Technology Department hosted their annual jobs fair, and there was no shortage of job opportunities for the 200 students and the 25 employers from the public and private sectors. City Tech, tries, City Tech ties to the local economy are strong, and we want to ensure we continue to serve its workforce development needs. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today and for your continued support in making City Tech and all, C all CUNY the public path to possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. City Tech is a Hispanic serving institution? It is. Can it's you talk, been, please? Oh, absolutely. So it's actually, we are celebrating our 25th year as a Hispanic serving institution with 34% of our students being Hispanic descent and 28% being black. And what does that mean in terms of equity? In term, I mean, I know we're asking a lot about data, but what does that mean in ter uh, to you and to the college um, and as it relates to data and, and results in terms of equity? So something of interest, what makes City Tech unique in the CUNY system is that we offer, in particular, engineering technology programs, which is often a gateway for many of our underserved um, minorities, particularly our black and Hispanic students. And I complete total segue in terms of topic. One of the challenges that we are facing, and this is actually at the state level, and myself and a number of other uh, campuses, but also SUNY campuses, are working with state government to recognize that the engineering technology credential, which is accredited nationally just as engineering programs are, don't receive the same type of equity in terms of professional licensure and access to promotion because it's labeled engineering technology. But it's really just more a different application of the degree, so many of our students tend to, DOT is a perfect example, they tend to work in the government sector. They have very applications-based, on-the-ground types of jobs that are in the engineering disciplines, and they can go on for licensure. And actually, the DOT requires that eventually. Um, our sister, our sibling school, City College, offers the traditional engineering degree. And because certain licensing requirements are different, so our engineering technology students don't have access to the license until two years after our engineering counterparts. So this is something that we've been trying to fight for to say that in terms of equity, because most of our students do fall under that population, um, one of my colleagues did a calculation and $40,000 of salary is lost because of that gap and the ability just to get licensed. So I, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but what we're trying to do is find equity in terms of our programs that very much serve our Hispanic and black students. Um, and it's something we're continuing to work on. I can, if I, I can find the legislation, I could pass it to you that's currently in the process of being passed where they're trying to change the language from just, uh, just uh, candidates can approach licensure or are eligible for licensure and right now it explicitly says only engineering and we're trying to add the words end engineering technology because we have the STEAM Center High School in the Navy Yard, we have City Poly, we have P-TECH, we have all of these programs that are articulating directly into city tech's programs, and we want to be able to provide those, those employment opportunities for them. Thank you for that, and would be very much interested in that legislation. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. We will now call the Zoom panelist Eli Dvorkin. Time starts now. Hello, can you see and hear me okay? We sure can. 
Terrific. Well, good afternoon. My name is Eli Dvork, and I help run the Center for an Urban Future. We're an independent research organization focused on building a stronger and more equitable economy in New York. I thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. So I'm here to talk about one key aspect of CUNY's role in developing New York City's future workforce as a launch pad into the city's fast-growing technology sector. Over the past decade, the city's tech sector has added 114,000 jobs, becoming the city's most consistent source of new middle and high-wage employment. But even as demand surges, New Yorkers of color and women remain strikingly underrepresented in the city's tech workforce. Fortunately, no institution is better positioned to help expand access to tech careers than CUNY. CUNY graduates nearly 4,000 students each year with technology degrees, more than any other university in the city. Approximately half of these students are Black and or uh, Hispanic, and most come from households earning less than $40,000 per year. However, New York has only just begun to harness CUNY's remarkable potential to serve as the city's largest and most equitable springboard into tech. Today, most tech companies in the city employ few, if any, CUNY grads. Just half of all CUNY computer science grads over the past five years were employed in computing jobs one year after graduation, and these graduates earn about 31% less than the average worker in the same computing occupations. One key reason for this is CUNY's internship gap. Just 10% of all CUNY students report participating in a paid internship during their college careers. Now, fortunately, New York City has launched several successful programs that are helping CUNY students pursue degrees and break into the tech sector, but these initiatives still serve only a fraction of the students who could benefit. For example, CUNY students who participate in the city's Tech Talent Pipeline Residency Internship Program are more than three times as likely to secure a full-time job after graduation as their peers. However, the program has only reached about 750 students over the past five years. Uh, CUNY's highly successful tech prep program serves just 170 students annually. And the $20 million CUNY 2X Tech Initiative, which succeeded in doubling the number of students earning tech bachelor's degrees, has only reached seven of 25 colleges so far, and the funding expires this year. And our research finds that most CUNY colleges have no more than two or three career counselors per 10,000 students. So what can city officials do? Well, in the coming days, the Center for an Urban Future will be publishing a new report entirely focused on harnessing this opportunity. But for now, please allow me to mention three specific recommendations. One, build on the track record of CUNY 2X Tech and launch a new CUNY Tech Success Initiative to sustain and scale all of these effective but small scale efforts. Two, support a major expansion of career services and employer relations staff at every CUNY college with the goal of bringing down these sky high ratios of counselors to students and making CUNY much more accessible to employers. And three, partner with tech industry leaders and current intermediaries to launch 2,500 new paid tech industry internships with a focus on recruiting from CUNY. For more, check out all of our research at nycfuture.org. And thank you all so much for the opportunity to testify today. Oh, perfect timing. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have any questions from the committee. I want to thank you for your testimony. I'd like to ask, is there anyone else in the gallery who would like to testify today? Seeing that, I want to thank you. I want to thank my chair, my co-chair, uh, Chair Farias, um, for co-chairing this really important hearing with me about workforce development and CUNY. And with that, uh, we are adjourned.